Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the, for our Western Regional Community Workshop. This is put on by the International Myeloma Foundation. We're going to be videotaping this and replaying slides will be on our website at myeloma.org in the next few days. But bring out your notepad, get a pencil and a pen. There's going to be some great talks. I can't thank our sponsors enough, Abby, Amgen, Bristol, Myers Squibb, GSK, Jensen Oncology, Cario Farm, Santa Fe, and Takeda. Oh my goodness, that was a lot of sponsors. Thank you, sponsors. We really appreciate everything you do. Okay, this is really important on how to do things. This is an audience Q&A with panel. Open the Q&A window allowing you to ask questions. So you'll see that, and then you can do a couple of things. You can type your question in, send it anonymously, and it goes to our, our uh, chat box, and the doctors will follow those and answer your questions. Next slide. Okay, feedback. I can't, it, just can't tell you how important this is. We have got to hear from you for our next year educational program. So you just take the time. It's only gonna take a couple of minutes, but it's incredibly important to our foundation and what we do for the future. This is the agenda. We start out with my welcome. I think that's about five minutes. We're going to go to Myeloma 101 with Dr. Joseph McHale. He's the Chief Medical Officer at the International Myeloma Foundation. And then life is a canvas. You are the artist. Rebecca Liu, who is, I believe, new to our, our nurse leadership board, and she's at MD Anderson Cancer Center. We go into frontline therapy. Ala Abdallah, MD, University of Kansas Medical Center. Fantastic. Then we go to questions and answers with the panel. And at 7.15, we take a break. After that, we start with maintenance therapy, Dr. Alla, and then we go to relapse area and clinical trials. All of these are very, very important. As I said, get your pen and paper. Next slide. We have an info line. We've had it for 30 years. You can call and get a help at info line, excuse me, 800-452-CURE, which is 2873, or info line at myeloma.org. Paul Hewitt, Missy, and Teresa Michelle do fantastic help, and they've been doing it for years. Next slide. Look at all these publications. Look at them all, because I guarantee one of these publications is going to be helpful for you, if not a couple of them. You'll see we have tip cards. We have new publications. We have hard uh, book publications, but you can get all this online and it's easy to do. Look at them online, pick your book and take some time to do this. It's under publications, next slide. Well, I'd like to again, introduce a friend and a great doctor, Dr. Joseph McHale. He's the chief medical officer at the International Myeloma Foundation. And we all should be very grateful that he's working with us tonight. Joe, take it away. Thanks, Kelly. I'm I'm the grateful one. Uh, always appreciate the host with the most, with the DJ voice that you've got. But, uh, thank you for kicking us off tonight. And uh, it's a particular joy to uh, share the stage with my dear friends here that uh, are relatively new to working us with the IMF, but hopefully we'll be able to engage them over the long term. Rebecca, it's great to have you here. And uh, uh, Dr. Abdallah, we're very grateful for the work that uh, you do as well and for joining us tonight. So to kind of level set, <clears throat> I always like to start these workshops with what we call Myeloma 101. Now, if you're here tonight and you're rather experienced with myeloma, I still think there's a tremendous value in Myeloma 101 because one, it sometimes fills in some gaps of things that you may have not picked up along the way, but it also helps you be able to explain it potentially to others um, who go or are going through the myeloma journey together. So let's just think a little bit about what uh, myeloma is. Uh, and that'll set the stage for the treatment that we'll be discussing later. So what I want to do over the next uh, 20 minutes or so that we have together is to think about the basics of blood and blood cancer, and we'll define what myeloma is, talk a bit about staging, and how we generally think about the approach to therapy. And then I want to put uh, a little bit of a bug in our ears regarding health disparities. I have the privilege of leading the IMF efforts in our um, what we call Empower Project that we'll share with you as we work in health disparities. This is particularly important in myeloma, a disease that for those of us who are of African descent, the disease is twice as common. Uh, and yet, sadly, we see very uh, reduced survival in that population. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. 
So what are the basics of blood? Now, I'm a hematologist, so is uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, Rebecca works within this field. So we're kind of blood geeks, right? We, we, we love this kind of stuff. And I know it's gross to other people, but you don't normally think of the blood as an organ, right? When you hear organ, you think heart and kidney and lungs. But honestly, the heart, kidney, and lungs are useless without blood, right? They need us. Um, and so we think of blood as an organ. And when you think of that blood, it's made up of two bits. There's the liquid bit that we call the plasma, and then there's the solid bit that we call uh, the cells that are within it. And, and for those of us, and uh, those of you who are listening in in the evening, you some of you may be listening with a little glass of vino with you, uh, then let's find a, a, a follow a wine theme uh, that you have three kinds of cells in your blood, uh, what I jokingly sometimes call white, red, and rosé. So we've got uh, red cells, that are basically like little trucks that carry oxygen. So think of them as, as these little trucks that when you breathe in oxygen, they come <clears throat> and pick it up, go deliver them to the tissues, and then come back for more. White cells are a lot more complicated. We're going to be talking a lot more about white cells tonight. White cells are like the, the, uh, your immune system, and they're like soldiers in an army that protect us. In fact, there are five types of white cells, like there are five major branches of the military. And then lastly, the rosé, as I call them, or not really rosé, but platelet cells. Uh, these are tiny little cells that help you clot. If someone cuts themselves, the first thing on the scene are the platelets. That's why I call them like an ambulance. They get there first, they patch up the problem, they make a phone call to the uh, uh, to what we call our clotting factors that form a blood clot. And all of these cells are made in the factory of your blood, what we call the bone marrow. And that's what brings us to the concept of multiple myeloma. Because myeloma is what we think of as a blood cancer or a cancer that originates in that factory of your blood. So in that factory that makes the red and the white and the rosé, we have all sorts of different kinds of cells. You know, if I want to know how a car factory is working, I can look at the cars that come off the assembly line. But if I really want to understand it, I got to go inside the factory. And if we go inside someone's bone marrow, that's where we see all these different kinds of cells. And within the whole factory, there's just one small area, typically less than 5% of the whole factory, that are a group of cells called plasma cells. And these are really important. Whether you know it or not, we've been talking about plasma cells throughout the whole pandemic. Because plasma cells are the cells that make antibodies. And as you know, in medicine, we love to use words that patients don't understand. Uh, we call them immunoglobulins, or antibodies that help you fight off infection. So if Rebecca gets a flu shot today, which I suspect she'll probably get one over the next few weeks, as most of us are getting our flu shots, that flu shot sends a message to her plasma cells. And her plasma cells respond by making antibodies so that if, God forbid, she gets the flu, that her body has a good way of fighting it off. Myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells. So instead of the plasma cells making good antibodies that fight off infections, now they make bad antibodies that can actually damage the body. And so that bad antibody we sometimes call monoclonal because it's identical as opposed to being different shapes and sizes of the antibodies we should have. And so we call it the M or the monoclonal protein or the M protein um, of uh, multiple myeloma. Now, this picture is ridiculous complicated and there's letters and numbers everywhere and I don't do this to creep you out or to scare you but to remind us that myeloma is actually a really weird disease not only does it originate in the bone marrow and those two purple cells are the myeloma cells but this is meant for those who want to understand the disease even a little bit more to recognize that it's not just about the, ba the bad cells that live there Th these cells are so intelligent that they actually start to take over the environment they live in. Sometimes we call this the bone marrow micro environment. So it's not just like a lump of cells, like in a lung cancer. I'm not making light of any other cancers, but you know, a group of lung cancer cells, they kind of grow together and they occupy the space in the lung. Here, because these plasma cells live in the bone marrow, they start to affect the whole of the factory and they start to take charge of all these other cells that are driven by the factory. And we're going to hear a little bit later from uh, Dr. Abdullah and myself 
how we've learned about this and how we can actually turn the environment on those plasma cells and use the other parts of the immune system to actually uh, destroy someone's own plasma cells. So we'll hear more uh, a bit about that later. And so again, myeloma is a ca uh, uh, cancer of the plasma cells. It accounts for about 2% of all cancer. So it's not that common in one way, although I'll show you in a moment, there's something very common about myeloma. The average age of diagnosis is about 69 to 70 years old, uh, but we do see significant differences by race and ethnicity, and I'll come back to that a little bit later because it's, it's particularly diagnosed younger in African-American patients and Hispanic-American patients. Last year, this year, we're expecting somewhere around 35,000 patients will be diagnosed with the disease, and tragically, about 13,000 will die of this disease. Um, and so we're going to hear some very exciting things about new therapies, new approaches, but we still have a long way to go. But thankfully, the average survival of myeloma patients is really now closer to 10 years. Um, back in the day when I started a myeloma and, you know, uh, uh, Rebecca and uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah here were, uh, were still in utero or something, um, you know, when I started a myeloma, um, we saw patients maybe live one to two years with this disease. And now we've seen it much, much longer, and we hope it to be even more so in the near future with the great therapies that you're going to hear about tonight. And I'll talk a bit more about uh, race and ethnicity in a few moments, but I did note earlier that myeloma is twice as common in African-American patients when compared to Caucasian patients. And sadly, the mortality, meaning that the, the time from diagnosis to death um, is significantly worse in the African-American population. So a black man today diagnosed with myeloma is expected to live half as long as a white man with myeloma. And that's obviously not acceptable to us. And one of the reasons why it's such a priority to the IMF, but I'll come back to that later. So I mentioned that myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells that make antibodies and that these bad antibodies can damage us. So thankfully, when we follow our patients with myeloma, we don't have to do a bone marrow test every single time we see them. Uh, for many of us, we know, of course, that we would not want to be experiencing that. Um, and um, it, it would be a, a little bit challenging uh, to, to have that done on a, a regular basis. Um, and so we can test and follow the disease in the blood through the protein or through the abnormal um, uh, uh, antibody that is created uh, that we described earlier. And so um, we can measure it by the type of, of antibody. And so more often than not, patients have what we call a full intact antibody. These antibodies look like these Y-shaped things. And so we have different types, what's so called the IgG type, the IgA type, and the IgM type are the most common. But sometimes there's a little piece of that big antibody that breaks off, the, what we call the light chains. So some patients, we can measure both the full antibody and some extra light chains. But in some patients, we have just the light chains. And that's in about 20% of people. And then uh, uh, bizarrely, and sometimes in a challenging way, we have some patients that actually their plasma cells are growing and they're abnormal, but we don't measure any of that monoclonal protein, what we call non-secretory myeloma. That can sometimes be a bit more challenging to manage because we don't have the opportunity to more easily measure the disease. So again, about a little over half of patients have the IgG type, 25% uh, IgA type, and much less commonly the other ones, as I mentioned, about 20% have the light chain only disease. So I know that most of us aren't used to looking at these weird things, but if I just look at uh, Rebecca's serum tonight, if I take a little blood sample from her and I do this test that we call a serum protein electrophoresis, it should look like this. And this is basically showing us all the proteins we have in our blood. There's that big mountains uh, of protein. That's something called albumin, which is the most common protein we have in our blood. And then we have all these other little proteins. And at the end, well, that sort of little smaller hill, you know, uh, uh, I guess none of us really live close to the Rockies, but imagine that the big mountain is the Rockies and that little hill at the end is like my little hills that I live near here in Scottsdale, Arizona. That's where all of our antibodies are measured in the blood. And this is what a normal serum protein electrophoresis should look like. But when we have myeloma, we know that those antibodies now are being produced abnormally in a larger quantity. And so now we have this spike 
of bad protein on this test. And that's why sometimes you may hear your doctor or your healthcare team uh, refer to this as a M spike, that monoclonal bad protein spike. And in this case, the person has uh, an IgG uh, monoclonal protein or M spike in their blood. Now, when we, again, make the diagnosis, as I showed you before, we sometimes look for the whole of the uh, immunoglobulin protein or, or uh, my antibody, we call the heavy and light chains together or just the light chains on their own. Now, interestingly, even though myeloma is not very common, about 2% of all cancers, 5% of people over the age of 40 if I look really closely at their, at their blood, it's very common for us to make a little bit of this abnormal protein. You know, we see this in a lot of cancers. Um, if I go and biopsy the prostate of every man over the age of 75, a lot of them are going to have just a tiny amount of prostate cancer. Not enough that we even need to touch it because it's never really going to affect them. And so in myeloma, we have a condition that precedes myeloma, that's incredibly common, was, was uh, coined, the phrase was coined by my uh, mentor at Mayo Clinic. Uh, uh, well, I had the privilege of working at Mayo Clinic for 10 years with Bob Kyle. He called it monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And that's a big phrase to basically say, someone's got a little schmutz of this abnormal protein, but it's not hurting anybody then that can transform into what we call smoldering myeloma, where there is more of that protein, there is more plasma cells are now starting to grow, but it's still not enough that we need to treat. And this is a, a, a challenging concept in myeloma that we don't often see in a lot of solid tumors. You know, I wouldn't speak to a woman with a little bit of breast cancer and say, oh, you only have a little bit of breast cancer. Um, I, I don't think we're going to treat you. No, we want to get rid of it right away. But in myeloma, patients can have very small amounts of disease that may not be hurting them. And so we may decide to not even treat them. But when myeloma starts to affect our organs or looks like it's about to affect our organs, like the kidneys, like the bones, uh, like uh, uh, the rest of our blood work uh, and the factory of our blood, then people have truly what we call active multiple myeloma. But the challenge is we can't, it's not always easy to make the diagnosis. A lot of people with myeloma just present with fatigue, and who of us haven't been fatigued even today? Um, a, a little over um, half of patients have some kind of pain that is typically in the bone, uh, more commonly in the back, but not necessarily in the back. And if certain blood tests are done, we know that uh, approximately three quarters of patients will have some form of anemia, which is the low red blood cell count. When I talked about the white, red, and rosé, that about a third, uh, three quarters rather, of patients will have some amount of anemia. We classically describe the symptoms uh, and the findings of myeloma under what we call the CRAB criteria, which means people's calcium can be elevated, they can have renal or kidney damage, they can have anemia or that low red blood cell count, or they have some kind of bone effect, which is typically thinning, if not even unfortunately breaking of the bones. And so uh, that's the CRAB criteria. But recently we added three more things to that that we now call the slim CRAB criteria because we don't want to only diagnose someone with myeloma when we see that they're already damaging their kidney or breaking a bone. I sometimes describe it, unfortunately, because I'm a runner, I always put things in running analogies. But if I'm running towards a cliff, hopefully Kelly is going to see me. Maybe Kelly's running faster than me anyway. And, and he's going to stop me from falling off the cliff. We used to say, well, you don't have myeloma until you have damaged your kidney or damaged your bone. But if you get really close to the cliff, we may as well stop people. So now we've added these three other criteria that if someone has 60% of their plasma cells in the bone, uh, of their bone marrow or plasma cells, if that light chains in the blood are really high, or if when we image them, we see on the MRI these what we call focal lesions or areas of activity of the bone marrow, we know that means that someone's getting really close to that cliff. <laughs> important for us to begin treating them right away. And so now we call, instead of the CRAB criteria, uh, we call it the slim CRAB criteria. 
And so without going into a lot of detail here, just to give you a bit more uh, light into what these crab symptoms are. And as Kelly mentioned, you know, these slides are gonna be available to you. So uh, I don't necessarily have to say everything that's on, on every one of these slides, but in addition to the crab criteria, we do see some other effects because this is a cancer of the immune system, people do have an increased uh, risk of infection. And sadly, we learned more about this during the pandemic and at other times. So it is important for us to understand that myeloma really can affect the whole uh, of the body. Uh, when we think of how we stage myeloma, you know, in solid tumors, we always say, well, is it localized or is it advanced or metastatic? Myeloma is a little bit different. We stage it really based on when we look at those individual plasma cells, we can look at the genes of those plasma cells. These aren't the genes that you pass on to your kids per se. These are the genes of the plasma cells themselves. And when we find certain things in those plasma cells that are abnormal, then we know that they are what we would call higher risk disease. And so we do this by a process that's called FISH or uh, uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization, which is just a fancy test on the bone marrow that we do. And we look for certain things, like if part of chromosome 17 is missing, or if someone has an extra part of chromosome one, or if they have what we call translocations, which just means that a little piece of one chromosome, a little piece of other chromosome that are supposed to be living apart get together, uh, then we know that can be a problem. So we see that with translocation 414 or 1416, as you see here. And so these are the kinds of things that help us determine does someone have higher risk myeloma versus standard risk myeloma, knowing that about 25% of patients have high risk myeloma and about 75% have standard risk myeloma. We put this into a staging system that's called the uh, revised international staging system. We're actually just about to uh, have a second revision of this that's become more commonly used, but I won't go into too much detail today. What this means for the patient is as much as possible, and one of the reasons why we hold workshops like this, knowledge is power. We want you to understand these tests it to some degree, to the degree that you feel comfortable so that you can have a conversation with the nurse or with the doctor or with the uh, nurse practitioner or the physician assistant as part of your healthcare team to understand that we have those basic blood tests. We have those blood tests that are specific to myeloma that we talked about where we'd look for the proteins in the blood. And sometimes we look for those same proteins in the urine as well. Because when we plan treatment in myeloma. You know, back in the day, as I said, 25 years ago, when I started a myeloma, we didn't have a whole lot of treatment planning because we really only had one or two drugs. Well, now we have uh, the Cheesecake Factory menu uh, of choices for myeloma. We want to make sure we match that to you. I say it all the time. I don't treat myeloma. I treat people. And it's so important. We've shown over and over again that when people have a strong and good connection with their healthcare team, they're gonna do better. And so it's important that you know what those options are and have that conversation with your uh, team that are taking care of you. And so choosing a treatment plan always puts the patient in the middle. And we look at all these other features, the other parts of your health, uh, to potentially your age, the risk status that you have, all these symptoms get put together and all these things get put together to help make a decision. Often we encourage people to get what I prefer to call an expert opinion as opposed to second opinion. We can use the word second opinion, but sometimes it implies that the first one was wrong. But you know, we have a lot of people that take care of a lot of different cancers in this country and, and I'm so thankful for all of them. But myeloma can be pretty complicated. And sometimes having a discussion with a true myeloma expert, like we have Dr. Abdallah here tonight uh, and myself uh, in the work that we do and in, in the specialized work that Rebecca does uh, can very help be helpful to you in understanding the disease better and understanding your options. Now, in my last few minutes, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we think about the treatment of myeloma. This is the fancy schmancy slide, but the bottom line here is that it shows to us that even though most patients have that MGUS phase beforehand where the disease is not very active, becomes active, that we treat this disease and it's really quite treatable. We still don't think of it yet truly as being curable, but what we do is we treat people and the disease level goes back down. That's what that, that red line means. And they go into some kind of remission. It's not a cure, but they've gone into remission. But the tragic part of this disease is it does keep coming back. 
And so typically people get multiple types of treatments over time. And sadly, with each relapse, every time the disease comes back, it tends to be a little bit more aggressive. And so we want to uh, treat as carefully and as well as we can early on to have an outcome in the long run. Now, the next couple of slides are by no means one that I'm going to read, but I've created this slide just to help us understand that we have so many choices in myeloma. And you're going to hear, uh, in particular, in Dr. Abdullah's pr presentations and mine, how we combine these drugs together and how we use them. But what I've tried to do here is just divide up the classes of these drugs. You know, we have right now, if you will, three major classes of drugs, what we call IMIDs, or the immunomodulatory drugs, drugs like revlimid and pomalidomide in, in that first column. And then in the blue, we have the proteasome inhibitors, the ones that typically end in MIB, like bortezomib, which is also Velcade, or carfilzomib, which is also kytoprolis. And then down in the green, what we call the monoclonal antibodies, drugs like Darzalex and Sarclisa. Uh, but we have these other previously used uh, chemotherapy drugs and the steroids, everybody's favorite uh, dexamethasone, that we learn to love and hate because it's helpful, but we like to get the dose down. But we now have newer uh, drug classes as well. In purple at the bottom, something called XPO1 inhibitors with a very active drug called Selenexor. Uh, we have two drugs at the top of the second column that right now are, are, are on hold, if you will, from the FDA, uh, but some of our patients may still be on these. And then perhaps most exciting that we're going to hear more about tonight are these newest of treatments, the CAR T cell therapy and these bispecific antibodies where we can actually employ someone's own immune system to attack the myeloma. I mean, this is almost like watching a science fiction movie when you think of the things that we're doing now. It's really quite remarkable. And of course, we have so many more things that are soon to come. So I won't spend a lot of time on this for time's sake, but I'm just going to um, note that uh, in particular, this exciting process of CAR T cell therapy, and we're going to hear more about how we use this, but just to make it very simple for you, what we do with CAR T cell therapy is we take T cells out of a patient. So T cells are a form of white cell. Think of them like a soldier that can be trained. And we take it into the lab and we train that cell to know what myeloma looks like. And here's the really cool part. We actually multiply them in the lab. So I can collect a, 100 T cells from you and I'm going to give you a million back. And then we give them back to the patient. And now these souped up T cells, which are, which are just waiting to attack myeloma, are released into your system. Uh, we call them chimeric antigen receptor cells because we put a receptor on the outside that's going to recognize the myeloma. And so now we have two different types of CAR T cell therapy that have been approved. And lastly, what we call bispecific antibodies. So now we have drugs that instead of having to take T cells out of you and manufacture them and give them back, now we just give a drug to patients that has two arms. One arm grabs onto the myeloma cell, the other arm grabs onto one of your local T cells and says, hey, uh, Mr. T cell, Ms. T cell, uh, I want you to be activated and attack the myeloma. And it's really remarkable. We now actually have three different uh, by specific antibodies that we're going to be discussing tonight that have been approved uh, by the FDA. And as we use these drugs, we use them to hook onto the outside of myeloma cell, uh, the outside of the myeloma cell. And so you're going to hear over the course of the evening that we leverage these different things that stick out of the myeloma cell as an opportunity onto it. So I'm pretty much going to wrap up with my favorite slide, which is this mm -hmm. one that uh, I build this slide every year and I keep adding to it. And uh, I know there's so many words on the page, but if you just look to the far right, it's amazing. We just keep adding more and more drugs to find a way to overcome this disease. And we've just had three drugs literally approved just over the last several months. Teclistamab, Telquetamab, Elranatamab, I don't make the names, by the way. Um, and so it's very exciting to see that we have more and more options, and we'll start to appreciate before too long how these drugs uh, work together. So as I close, I'm just going to remind us what I've already intimated early on, that um, myeloma is a disease that preferentially affects African Americans. I'm African American myself, so this is personal and professional for me, that it's twice as common. And sadly, we see that 
my uh, African American patients with myeloma have a much shorter survival than other patients, and and there's lots of reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with delayed diagnosis and with access to all these great therapies that we know can be improved uh, improve the survival of our patients with myeloma. We do know, however, that when given equal access. African Americans can have as good, if not a superior outcome with myeloma. So that tells us we can do a lot better. And I don't wanna be a long commercial for it as this is my last slide, but we at the IMF are doing all that we can to try and reduce that health disparity. We've created something called Empower Myeloma Power, which is really built on three pillars to engage the community, to understand better what myeloma is all about, to educate the primary care community to catch the diagnosis earlier on and to enhance the care uh, by individuals who care for myeloma patients in the hematology oncology community to have them appreciate this disparity and ways to overcome it. <laughs> we know that together we can do so much better than we are now. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca to chat with us about uh, managing myeloma si symptoms and side effects. And I'll just rem remind the crowd, uh, I see lots of questions coming in. Please submit your questions as Kelly instructed us at the start. And we're gonna have a little Q and A session after uh, the next two lectures and I'll facilitate those questions. So Rebecca, I'll turn it over to you, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. McPhail. I appreciate the introduction. It is an honor to be able to present to you all tonight. Um, we all know that everyone's myeloma is different and the course of myeloma is so different and unique for every patient. So this next piece that I am presenting is all about how you are the artist of your life and how you can live your most optimal life with myeloma. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk about different treatment options because there is a lot. And it really is like a color palette because there's a lot of different combinations and it just depends on what type of portrait you wanna paint. We will also talk about infection and side effects and how you can best approach your care by practicing and shared decision-making, which means knowing your team and the resources available. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, myeloma treatment. The most important goal when we initiate any treatment is ensuring that we have rapid and effective disease control that is durable, meaning that we get the myeloma down fast and keep it down. Of course, any good treatment we're taking must have manageable side effects. All of this contributes to improvement of your quality of life and overall survival. We also provide supportive care to our patients with myeloma in order to prevent and manage disease treatment related side effects. So this would be like the bone strengthening agents you take like Zometa or Denosumab um, to prevent bone disease or the aspirin you might take to prevent the blood clots. All this contributes to improved quality of life. Since everyone is different and of course may have different goals, it's important that you discuss your personal goals and priorities with your health team. So this slide is a very good depiction of the myeloma big picture. We have our initial therapy where we determine who is transplant eligible and who isn't. Transplant eligible patients would generally go to transplant, then consolidation with maintenance, while transplant ineligible patients would just go straight to consolidation and maintenance. After that, we treat again as the disease comes back. Everyone will receive supportive care regardless of where you are in this process. There are different shades of auto transplant, meaning that there is no black and white answer as to if stem cell transplant is right for you. So there's many different considerations to make, including the data that we see from research, clinical experience, patient preference that goes into making this important decision. It also requires some buy-in from the care partner. By understanding these different components, you can make the best decision if transplant would be best for you. So when we look at different patient symptoms that can impact quality of life, we can group these into three different categories. We have the physical, the psychological, and the financial. The physical symptoms are those that affect your physical well-being. And you may be familiar with some of these. These, in, these can include fatigue, constipation, pain, neuropathy, impaired physical functioning, or sexual dysfunction. Psychological symptoms are those that affect your mental well-being and can include depression, anxiety, sleep disturbance, decreased cognitive function and decreased role in social function. Financial is an important and sometimes overlooked symptom as patients may have a financial burden or financial toxicity related to their treatments. 
Fatigue, anxiety, and depression are very common symptoms. Almost all patients have some level of fatigue, whether related to their disease or to their treatment. It could be from anemia, pain, bone marrow suppression, or from riding the highs and lows of steroids, which we'll talk about next. Over 35% of patients report anxiety and 25% depression. I'm often curious of how many patients are not captured in this data because they don't report their anxiety or depression. I have patients who always tell me they are fine, they're fine, and it turns out they're de dealing with severe depression that can be managed just as diabetes, hypertension, or whatever other chronic illness could. So it's very important that you talk to your provider about this. Okay, let's talk about steroids. It's a drug we love to hate and hate to love. So as providers, we love steroids because they make up part of the backbone of myeloma treatment. They're synergy. They're efficacious against myeloma, but they do come with substantial side effects. When I go over the consent forms of my patients for our frontline treatments, my patients are shocked by the side effects of steroids when they see the page upon pages of side effects that steroids carry. Those of you who have been on several lines of therapy know the dark sides to steroids. It can cause annoying side effects like fatigue, insomnia, sweating, muscle cramping, weight gain, and hair thinning, mood swings and irritability, GI symptoms like bloating and gas, to more serious side effects like blurred vision, cataracts, diabetes, increased risk of infection, heart disease, and heart hypertension. There are a few things you can do to help manage these side effects, like taking the steroids on a consistent, consistent schedule. So, you know, taking it the same time every day. And you'll want to try and take these with food. Um, you can also take over-the-counter prescription medications to help with um, any GI symptoms that you feel. You may need to take medications to help prevent shingles, thrush, thrush, or other infections that you might become more susceptible to. No matter what, though, do not stop or adjust steroids without discussion with your healthcare provider. Steroids need to be tapered and should not be stopped cold turkey so your provider can work with you on that. CAR-T and bispecific antibodies have really come to the forefront of myeloma therapy, and it does carry side effects that are unique. One of the main side effects we watch for in CAR-T and bispecifics is something called CRS, which is also known as cytokine release syndrome. And this occurs due to bulk T cell activation, which can lead to a massive release of inflammatory proteins called cytokines. This release causes a constellation of symptoms, um, as you see here in this wheel, um, such as confusion, weakness, shortness of breath, somnolence, fatigue. But the main symptoms we see up front is fever. And this is usually mitigated with antipyretics, so being, uh, drugs like acetaminophen. Typical onset of cytokine release syndrome occurs anywhere from one to five days and can vary depending on the product that the patient is given. Usually it's mild, but it can progress and become more serious if not um, treated. Neurotoxicity can occur with or without CRS and can be also very serious. Patients who have neurotoxicity may experience um, everything in this color, with this wheel right here. So things like headache, confusion, altered wakefulness, hallucinations, ataxia, praxia, facial nerve palsy, tremors, seizures, and encephalopathy. That's a lot. So this is why for patients with CAR-T, we ask for caregiver presence because your family, your friends are the people who know you best and they're more able to recognize changes in mental status more quickly before any healthcare provider might. I've had family members who have told me the patient is acting a little bit differently, just, just a little bit more strangely, which has prompted the team to conduct more urgent evaluation to ensure that they're not starting to have neurotoxicity. There is a seven to tenfold increase of bacterial and viral infections for patients with myeloma. So it's absolutely important to mind infection precautions. Always report fevers of more than 100.4 degrees, shaking chills even without fever, shortness of breath, or low blood pressure. I've had patients who have full-blown infections who wait to come to the emergency, emergency center when they know they have a fever. When I ask them, you know, why didn't you come, most of the, the time they tell me they thought it would go away or they just weren't sure. It's a statement my, pa my parents would totally make, right? So the public service announcement today is do not take your symptoms lightly or ignore them. Myeloma and the treatments we give decreases your ability to fight off infections, and this is serious. So what can you do to prevent infections? Well, we follow standard precautions like washing your hands, avoiding crowds. As post-COVID quarantine restrictions have become very lax and almost non-existent, this increases the risk of your exposure to the virus. So wear a mask if, around others, and especially if you are neutropenic. 
socially distance, receive growth factors and prophylactic medications as indicated by your health team, such as Valtrex for shingles prevention, and stay on top of your immuniz immunizations and uh, do not get any live vaccines. So live vaccines would be like the MMR vaccine. Um, follow the old adage, which is the best treatment is prevention. Many of the treatments that we administer for myeloma can cause GI symptoms, such as diarrhea or constipation. And diarrhea can be caused by a variety of things, such as laxatives, antacids, or too much magnesium. And it can also occur as a side effect from antibiotics, antidepressants, or myeloma treatment. Some of my patients love, love, love supplements, but these supplements can also carry a risk. So drugs like milk thistle, aloe, cayenne, salt palmetto, ginseng, they, this can also contribute to diarrhea. Also, we know that some sugar-free substitutes can increase diarrhea. So talk to your provider if you're experiencing diarrhea, and they may consider antidiarrheal medications like Imodium, fiber binding agents, or colosabalum. You may want to avoid caffeinated, carbonated, or heavily sugared beverages, as this can worsen your diarrhea. I know these are all our you know, favorite things. <laughs> Constipation can be caused by a variety of medications. Um, opiates are common offenders. Lot, myelomas can be very painful, so a lot of our patients are on opiate pain medications. Supplements like iron can also cause constipation. You'll want to increase your fiber intake of fruits, vegetables, high fiber foods. You should take these things even if you don't have constipation. You may also consider fiber binding agents like Metamucil, which I am a personal big fan of. My husband likes the raw grainy fiber that comes in the tin can and I need my smooth orange flavored Metamucil, so. Um, pain med management is so important because we know that myeloma can be very painful. Pain can happen from the disease, from neuropathy, or other medical procedures. Again, prevention is the best treatment. Ensure that you are taking bone strengthening um, agents as indicated, as these are known to decrease the risk of fracture. Take antivirals as prescribed to prevent shingles. I had a patient in the past who developed shingles of the face, and it was so incredibly painful for him. I always ask my patients if they have any new or worsening pain, as this can provide insight of what the myeloma is doing, whether it's controlled or not. This might prompt me to order the necessary imaging. You can try medications or treatment to help manage pain, but some patients swear by complementary therapies like acupuncture. I say do whatever works for you. You are the artist. So most of us are probably very aware of peripheral neuropathy. It is um, damage to the nerves of the extremities, and patients will often feel numbness, tingling, prickling sensations, or may be very sensitive to touch. This can be caused by the disease or from treatment, and it is very, very important to let your provider know if you have this to prevent further damage so they can adjust treatment um, dosing as needed and prescribe medications. Bortezomib is known to cause this symptom, and from experience, patients may need to have a reduction in the frequency of dosing. Ensure your environment is safe, as sometimes the neuropathy can be so severe that patients may not be able to feel the ground of which they walk, and they're more prone to trips or falls. Financial burden is something that just can't be ignored. Medical costs are astronomical with rising premiums, and even expenses that are not as obvious, like travel, food, housing. It's so important to address that therapy is time consuming and time spent away from work can translate to income loss. So if you need assistance, contact a social worker to discuss financial assistance. There may be some assistance available to you and we have a list down here. Again, prevention is the best treatment. As Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So manage your stress by ensuring plenty of rest and relaxation. Exercise and engage with others, socially distance as indicated, of course. And ensure you are following up with health screenings, vaccinations, things like that. Exercise and eat right, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Nine out of 10 of my patients always say they're drinking a lot of water when I nag at them. And nine out of 10, I tell them, whatever you think is adequate is not enough. Hydration is so important and helps protect your kidneys. And finally, protect your bones. Take bone strengthening agents, take calcium and vitamin D supplements, perform weight bearing activities, things like that. Okay, I think we're almost running out of time here. So um, I wanted to give a shout out to our caregivers. Caregiver support is so important in the myeloma journey. These caregivers are the ones that are helping with education, assisting the patients with daily activities and medical care. So it's important to have care partners, especially in the beginning of your, um, of, of your journey for your physical and mental well-being. 
And a care team doesn't just comprise of your healthcare providers, but it's centered around you. Don't be afraid to ask questions and reach out to your care team. The more you know about your disease, the more able you are to make informed decisions. Feel free to express your goals, values, preferences so that your care team can better understand what is important to you and your treatment options to cater to that. Know the members of your care team because they play because they play a vital role in your care. This will help you to know who to reach out to when you have questions. Shared decision making is very important and you should feel empowered to be a part of that treatment. You are the artist. And finally, make the most of your visit. Come prepared. Bring a list of medications, write down questions and concerns, bring a friend or family member to help take notes or ask questions. Telemedicine is now a very useful care modality and has improved access for many to healthcare. So ask your care team if this might be available to you. And again, knowledge is power. Um, use your resources. The International Myeloma Foundation is a great resource and has developed countless education programs to help patients. They are committed to walking through this journey with you because you are not alone. Thank you. Wow. And I think I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Abdallah now, um, who will discuss frontline therapy and newly diagnosed myeloma. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And uh, thank you, Kelly, for this invitation. I really appreciate that. Also, I would like to also to, uh, to tell uh, Dr. Michael, this is a big honor uh, for me to actually also presenting a lecture with you as well. You know, you're well known in the myeloma field. So uh, I'm really happy that I'm uh, also presenting this uh, lecture of front of line, uh, front line and uh, newly diagnosed myeloma. So uh, today I'm gonna discuss about uh, the most important thing as Dr. Michael has talked about how to diagnose myeloma, which is very important and very critical. And to make that diagnosis is really how huge it is. Uh, so we have to talk about how we're gonna start the treatment. But before I start the treatment, because I'm gonna talk about why are we treating these patients with what treatment we're using. I try to make this a simple example that we always have to remember that why we do randomized trials so we can get the best options of therapies for our patients. And this kind of like what we talk about, like uh, there was a drug in the past called urethane and they, uh, you know, was uh, comparing to a placebo. Uh, they uh, have patients who either got newly diagnosed or relapsed myeloma and they randomized these patients. And we were surprised about that there was non improvement of the survival. And although there was thought that urethane was a good uh, medication, possible uh, the reason of that there is more side effects from the drug and toxicity from the drug. But believe it or not, that is the reason why we believe that, as uh, Dr. Michael was saying, why we're having uh, in years, like years and years ago, that we have a patient who survived a year for myeloma. Now we're having 10 to 15 years, these patients surviving. It's because of these great trials and these great drugs that have been proven itself. Not only it's better, it's well qualified, it's less toxic, and that's our big goal in myeloma treatment. So what are the goals that we wanna talk about? Achieving a disease response, you know, and, and for a lot of us to understand that's a very important goal because achieving disease response, meaning that the myeloma, you know, you're killing the myeloma cells, the bad cells, you're trying to prevent any further damages to the kidneys, to the bones and et cetera. Um, reduce active symptoms, very critical. And this is one of the things I tell my patients, the most excited moment in my life when I see a patient coming to my office on a wheelchair and after a couple months at least he's coming back standing up because his back pain has gone away this is one of the best moments ever you know like you see exactly how much you transfer a patient from a bedridden person or who's on a wheelchair complaining of a lot of pain to a person like walking around because he's his pain is under control his myeloma is under control immediately that really makes a big joy seeing a patient who was on hemodialysis or close to be a dialysis and then you you know kind of remove these side of uh, these symptoms and uh, retract these uh, uh the, these uh, bad end organ damage that's really important and critical. We also trend to uh, try to prevent any additional morbidity that can happen from that. That's one of the goals. Prolong overall survival. That's what Dr. Michael was saying. Like it was one year and now we're talking 10 to 15 years. And that's a very important and important milestone that our myeloma treatments are actually, actually improving the survival for these patients. Not just only decreasing the number, important, minimizing the toxicity of the therapy. There's no point of giving a treatment 
and improving, you know, and uh, getting a patient living longer if I'm going to cause the patient to harm his kidneys or livers or have bad neuropathy. So we always make sure that we have minimum, minimum toxicity, uh, toxicity for these patients. Use of agents that we also have to kind of have some predictions and how we manage the side effects. And the good news is that as Dr. Michael say, and Rebecca mentions that always is great to have a second opinion, or as we call another opinion from a myeloma expert. It really makes a big difference. Sometimes it's not really like as everybody will have the same treatment or same management. You might have a patient who might not tolerate a Velcade or an Emmet, or uh, might be suitable for him to change to something else in order to avoid any major side effects, like a patient who uh, is diabetic and having more neuropathy. Carfilzomib might be a better suitable treatment. So these are examples why you know we have to always consider you know expert opinion for myeloma treatment. Maximize quality of life, as we talked about it. This is the whole purpose of that. I always tell the patients that I want to make sure that if you're working, you continue to work. If you're, have, you're active, you have to still have that activity and continue to do that. Administration, uh, administer medically and cost-effective therapies. And I think that's sometimes we struggle a lot with patients. We feel their financial burden. We try to assist and we try to make sure we choose not only the right treatment and also to make sure we have enough support and resources for these patients in order to receive the best options of therapies and in order to decrease that financial burden for them. Cure. Cure as much as I like to say it, do we cure myeloma? And I don't know if Dr. Michael will agree or disagree with me. We do cure myeloma up to 10 to 15% of my myeloma patient. However, I think we can do a better job. We're not yet there, but I think we can do a much better job in that case. So how do we start the staging of treatment of multiple myeloma? And I call this like the stages that, as Rebecca was mentioning, Dr. Michael also mentioned that at the beginning, that patients are either transmit eligible or non-eligible. And that's really what we talked about. 75% of the patient in our institution are eligible for transmit. 25 are either not eligible for transmit or they opted not to do the stem cell transmit. And we'll talk about that later on. But more important is that what we try to do is called induction therapy. You know, when you ha have a patient who comes here, either as uh, as we talked about that initially, that they're asymptomatic, but they have all the signs of myeloma, the protein levels high, the uh, bone marrow biopsy shows more than 60% plasma cells you want to start treatment, or they have starting off the crap criteria that Dr. Michael said, just mentioned, renal failure, bone lesions, or anemia, you need to actually get this as much as possible controlled. You need to decrease the burden of the disease and you start that. And then after that, it comes options of what we call the stages. I call the stages. If the patient eligible for a transplant, you do consolidation therapy with stem cell transplant, a high dose chemotherapy. And then after that, we will talk about that later on in another subject, maintenance therapy for these patients. So my job is to try to decrease the disease and the burden disease as much as possible to eliminate the last myeloma cell, hoping, hoping that maybe we can reach a cure rate. Maybe we can keep the patient in remission as long as possible. And we can talk about that more details. So this is exactly what we are talking about. In the right side, you can see how bad the myeloma can be. And you can see in the left side, our goal is to eliminate these type of myeloma patients and give the right treatment in order to receive, to achieve a full remission for these patients, you know, and, and to get a better quality of life because this patient was having a lot of pain and imagine how much his pain was uncontrolled and imagine how much that treatment helped a lot this patient to get into remission. So talking about induction therapy, I will start slowly from the old time, but not very old, you know. I'll talk that why we started to two, three drugs and then four drugs. And the reason of that is that we were looking at the response rate and we were surprised about that. We have really great drugs like the immunomodulatory drugs, the initial drug and the oldest drug is thalidomide. Uh, our uh, Dr. Bart Barlogi from University of Arkansas, who kind of like actually was a big part of this treatment. And now we, we, we saw Rivlimid and dexamethasone, the Velcade, uh, uh, which is a proteasome inhibitor involved. And then the combination therapy about let's add another drug started to be there. You know, we have great uh, treatments and the, and the combination therapy starts showing that the response rate is really improving. Not only the response rate, the depth of the response rate. So Rivlumid Velcade Dix became our standard of care, but we were not satisfied. Why? Because we're not curing the myeloma and we think we can do a better job. 
A new drug, you know, at that time, I'm say that man, relatively now it's not new anymore, carfilzomib, was there. It proved itself in relapsed myeloma. It was great treatment, better than Vilkid, by the way, in relapsed myeloma. So always we assume, like, if you have a better drug, can we use it a little bit up front? Can we move it one stop, at, you know, one, uh, one step ahead? And there was a trial to do that. And I was actually advocating for that. That drug will actually beat the Velcade for a different reason because it showed itself in the relapsed myeloma. So the study was not really the typical that we do in myeloma patients. Well, only one difference is that they did the induction therapy and give the three drugs, the Velcade, Rivlimidix to one arm and the Carfosa Rivlimidix to another arm. But these patients were opted not to do stem cell transplant. So they continue for several cycles, the treatment. And then after that, they move on to maintenance therapy. So that was one missing part. However, I was looking at other things like the response rate, the duration of response and how deep the response is. And the response rate was kind of like maybe you know, I will say this kind of like uh, hitting or leaning toward the carfilzomib was a little bit better, more deeper somehow. But I was a little bit disappointed about the progression-free survival, that the patients stayed in remission like average about 34 months in both arms, and the survival was similar in the groups. However, I will still say that I will still use the carfilzomib over Velcade, but there was only one problem here, the toxicity. That will make a difference. So one of the issues here is that when I saw the toxicity, I was really disappointed. I know the patients are going to have problem with the Vilcade because I have patients who suffer from the Vilcade and we try as much as possible to find better ways, as Rebecca was saying, like to actually salvage the problem about the neuropathy. And I wish if that was not the case, Vilcade will be a super drug, a better drug than anything else. But there was like a good percentage, at least in those who got a higher grade of neuropathy calling 8% difference. On the other hand, if you can see the lift one, there was issues about the carfilzomib. Carfilzomib can cause some heart failure in patients, high blood pressure, some lung toxicity, some kidney toxicity. That can be a difference of about 12% compared to the Vilkid. To be honest with you, that was one of the reasons I did not actually you know, change the practice about switching Vilkid to carfilzomib. I was worried because especially I want to send the patients to transplant, and I didn't want to kind of have this issue about lung or heart failure because every myeloma doctors who treated a lot of patients with carfilzomib might see like like heart failure. And, and the good news is that all my patients who got, uh, many of my patients who got heart failure from the carfilzomib was reversible, but it become very difficult, you know, to kind of restart it again or do it as initial therapy. Can I manage neuropathy? I can tell you, yes, we can manage neuropathy. So my, op, you know, optimal treatment here was to keep the Velcade there. But then we have the question here, a new drug evolved. Dartumab. Dartumab and Dr. Michael may, uh, may talk about that in the relapsed refractory myeloma, but that was one of the greatest drugs. You know, the story about how this drug kind of went as a rocket, you know, is amazing. Like it's a CD38 antibody, and really it's an effective drug. History of this drug. It was one of the drugs that patients didn't like it at the beginning, and there was one reason. Dr. Michael can support me about that. It was an IV drug. In the first dose, I have to tell patients that you have to stay in the clinic for 10 hours. Some clinics will have to do the uh, treatment for over two days. Some people have to admit the patients. And now we have evolved to do this drug as a subcutaneous injection. So I'm, surpri I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised how this drug moved faster to become a very great quality uh, drug for this. But the Griffin trial actually came here to tell us exactly the, what we do in myeloma patients in, in terms of standard of care. We induce the patients with Velcade, Rivlimidix. We send these patients for transplant. And I think there's some institutions do consolidation. Some institutions move on to Rivlimid maintenance. That's what we do. But the other arm here was to add the Dartumab to RVD. Do the transplant, do the consolidation therapy, more treatment for that for two cycles. But the maintenance therapy was adding Dartumab to Rivlimid. This was a really, in my opinion, one of the best studies ever in order to kind of like see, can we add the Artumab, can that make a big change? A big change in terms of like, you know, can we increase not only the remission rate, the progression-free survival, and hopefully the overall survival for these patients or not. In terms of tolerance, I was never worried about it because I believe that Artumab you know, short-term, long-term, we have used it. And I can tell you, it's one of the most tolerable medications I've ever seen so far comparing to other drugs. So looking at the results, we were not surprised about like, you know, you know, I know it's a little bit more complicated, but to summarize that, 
after the first induction therapy, there was a 98% versus 92% response rate, but the complete remission, there was a 6% differences. But the end of the study, or after, you know, there was 83% of the patients achieved complete remission versus 60%. There was a 23% who got more deeper remission comparing to the Rivlimid Velcade Dix arm in that case. So the response rate was beaten up there. Now, looking at the PFS, and I think the overall survival may take us a little bit longer in order to make a comments or not, you can see there was not any split at the beginning, which was, we were surprised about that. But you can see up to 36 months now the split is going on and it's happening here. And it shows really that impact and efficacy. So you can see like after all this follow up, you can see that patients, oh, sorry. Uh, you can see that the progression-free survival uh, is kind of becoming longer, although we didn't re uh, achieve the median PFS, but you can see that the separation happened after adding the daratum up there. Now, a lot of controversial about the high-risk myeloma and standard-risk myeloma, which we can talk about that later on, is that where do you kind of prefer to use it or not? That's really a lot of big questions, and that's one of the things that I have criticized, that we really need to start splitting patients for clinical trials to do more high-risk myeloma patients different and standard-risk my own patient in order to you know optimize the best induction therapy and maintenance therapy for the high risk myeloma patients and this is kind of like i call it like what's really happening in myeloma where dr michael just show you a big picture of all the medications that he used how many medication we have every time we have a new medication believe it or not we have to move it to the right spot. And every time we have the medication, we try to find the right combination therapy in order to get a better treatment. It's really not an easy job as much as possible because you need to actually give the right treatment in the right time. And I think that's where the problem here. And some of the treatments might actually make it to the higher level and become one of the optimal options. Like daratumab actually moved on from a last option of therapy now up to a first option and maybe a maintenance therapy. You don't know, I mean, how much it will happen and we don't know in the future. It might be replaced by the CAR T cell and the bispecific. So the good news is that you can see a lot of competition for all these drugs. And the greater news is that it's great to have these options here. And the question, how we're gonna make it better. Now, the commonest question I still get here is that what is the rule of stem cell transplant in myeloma patients right now? And I think it's a fair question. We're really doing great. I'm seeing patients, we're treating them most of the time, if not all the time, outpatient, and that's really good. Our treatments is really not supposed to be called chemotherapy. I don't know why we still do that. I mean, most of our treatments are targeted immunotherapy. We don't do any more big chemotherapy except the stem cell transplant and sometimes the cytoxin. So the problem here is that this type of chemotherapy, the melphalan, is what we call nuke the backyard. This is my mentor, Dr. Ganguly. He always teach me that. It's literally what we do. After we do the induction therapy, we go ahead and blast whatever remaining of the myeloma cells and kill it to pieces. And I think that's our big goal for this. And then we do the stem cell transplant for these patients. So we have always been discussing, me and Dr. Ganguly and many people, and I'm sure Dr. Michael also as well, he knows about this argument, you know, and I think people talk about early and late uh, transplant. What is the real criteria for that? And honest opinion, I will say this word, it really depends on the institution that you're on. So if you're in an institution that do a lot of transplant, they might be a little bit more confident to do a transplant on an 80-year-old patient or a 75-year-old patient. If you go to another institution who barely do uh, maybe like five or 10 transplant a year, they might have some hesitance about doing a transplant for a patient who's 65 or 68. So it really depends on the transplant centers. And this is what I found out, you know, for that reason. Kidney function and age really might not help be that much. You know, we have some tests that we do for these patients, priority tests, but more important is that sometimes patients have the desire, they don't want to do it. And there is a reason they don't want to do it. They may have some concerns about the side effects and toxicity, the caregiver. Um, I think, you know, the issue about being off uh, work for three months, I have patients who complain about that because it's a burden for them and they're, they have financial uh, conditions. They might ask not to delay it or delay these things. So we have to understand it's really as much as people think it's uh, a, a, a white and black, you know, it's really sometimes, and while well, I will say some of the times it could be a gray zone that we don't know exactly if the patient can get transplant or not. So the first study here was really between, and, and I, there was many studies actually for transplant, but one of the studies I like about this is that now to compare the newer treatments, the Rivlimid, Velcade, Dix versus Rivlimid, Velcade, Dix and transplant. So let's try to 
eliminate the transmit, the malformation transmit, and move on to maintenance. This was done in French, so I don't want. I know patients are going to ask about the maintenance therapy and how long you're going to give it. But in France, they just do one year of maintenance therapy comparing to the United States, which we will talk about that. We do it until patient progress. And there's a lot of question about the duration. So that was the difference in this study. The results, I don't know if you can see it here. You can see there was a difference. The patients who got stem cell transplant, they have a chance to stay in remission, a median, which is like up to 47 months versus 35 months, which is a difference of a year. Now, the overall survival after about eight years was similar in the both groups. Now, a lot of people use that as an excuse. Why should I do transplant upfront? And my answer for this, unfortunately, I will disagree with those who delay transplant. They might be reason or not, but here's what I will tell you. The reason I do transplant upfront, number one, it improves the PFS for these patients. Number two, I know the study here say that about 75% of the patients got a stem cell transplant later on. In my opinion, in my defense, when I say that, there is unlikely that will happen in our myeloma patient in real world because there's a lot of options of therapy. So if you don't get transplant, in our in our, uh, in our transplant center, you're 20% likely to get transplant, 80% will not get the transplant for reasons like there's other options. Patients will seek other options, alternative over that. Another reason is that Stem cell transplant also have a good remission, I mean, uh, duration of response for these patients. And I question exactly how much the stem cell transplant in the second relapse will give better response. Is it worth it to do it? You know, that will be a big question for me. So the reason why I'm actually with doing transplant upfront is that window. I don't think it's really large after the patient relapsed the first time, but more important than that window, I really don't know exactly how much the stem cell transplant will affect, you know, or cause any, um, uh, you know, any big benefit after that. The second study here, it's completely the same as the IFM except the maintenance survey, the determination study but this was done in the United States. And it's good to have two different studies here. The response rate was kind of close to each other, but you know, preferably it was better for the transplant. But if you can see here that the, uh, the patients who stayed in remission in the, in the red line, comparing to the blue line, you can see actually there was um, at least 20 months difference between these two groups. So patients who got transplant, they were in remission longer. However, after all these years, they were still having the same survival. So I still look at that, that this is kind of like showing me why transplant is beneficial in these patients. Now, this is what I can confirm that what happened in the United States. Although the first IFM study shows 75 or 80% of patients got transplant later on, only 28% of the patients got transplant uh, later on. They got other options of therapy. So that's why, and that's really what happened in real world is that we have even 20% of the patients will get a second transplant if they actually relapse. The third study, and also that also proved why we do stem cell transplant because of this. It was, uh, I think I think this was kind of like a little bit like, you know, three different arms. They used two arms to give chemotherapy or a stem cell, uh, stem cell transplant with induction therapy, but they use a different regimen, carfilzomib, cytoxin dix with uh, stem cell transplant or carfilzomib rivalimid dix with transplant. And the third arm was to do carfilzomib rivalimid dix for about 12 cycles and then re-randomize again to either rivalimid or carfilzomib rivalimid. Now, the only thing I want to focus is that the left one is about looking at how important a proteasome inhibitor and a rivalimid with stem cell transplant. You can see exactly is that this blue line showing how these patients can stay in remission longer comparing to using carfilzomib rivalimid dix without transplant or carfilzomib cytoxin dix without the imid and with transplant. So in just kind of like showing exactly what kind of like the core of treatment of induction therapy and consolidation is using a proteasome inhibitor with imid and stem cell transplant is very important to have a better and a longer response for these patients. So I will be very, very biased in this situation saying, do I think stem cell transplant should be considered a, a, a standard of care for newly diagnosed myeloma who are eligible for that? I do that, but I respect my patient's opinion and their concerns, and I try to address that. If they don't wanna do it, of course, we will support that, and we will try to kind of like talk and discuss all these issues. Now, what if the patient is not eligible for a transplant? I like these two studies, and I'm just going to focus on that. I know there's other studies about that, but the SWOG study, the Velcade Revlimid Dix versus Revlimid Dix, was done at that time. 
and it shows not only there was a remi- uh, the patients who have list relapse in those who got three drugs versus two drugs, there was also a survival benefit. And that treatment was the standard of care. And that was one of the great things about that treatment, having three drugs regimen in these patients who are ineligible for transplant. However, when the Maya trial came by, and as we say, the daratumab is kind of that drug that is showing itself. It came by and, it, you know, I know there was a lot of uh, concerns why we didn't do darivlimidix versus velcadarivlimidix, but the study was three drugs versus two drugs. And I was really impressed about the results. And the results show that the 60 months, the patients who got 60 months, like uh, about five years, they were still in remission. The median survival was a uh, median uh, uh, staying in remission was about 52% after five years. And not only that, the most important thing that I talked about before, the survival was better using the Dartuma up front comparing to the Revlimid Dix. And honest opinion, that was my biggest bias for the patient who are not eligible for transplant that Dartumab have to be a drug of choice for these patients, especially uh, for, for this case. Now, this is what I call like a, you know, a race between drugs. And I'm hoping in the future, we'll start seeing exactly head to head, which drug we can add in order to get an optimal treatment for these patients, especially in induction therapy, because I think we're doing really great. But I think we need to kind of like choose which one is the best option especially CAR T is evolving, bispecific evolving, we really need to start determining which one is better, especially in high-risk myeloma and standard-risk myeloma. It's really more complicated, and we really need to start putting standards of care because we're doing great in standard care of myeloma, but I think in high-risk myeloma, we need more studies just to focus on high-risk myeloma. My general principle initial therapy here is that I believe stem cell transplant is still a vital treatment. I recommend that you know, up front, you know, um, you know, and because I don't think these patients will receive it later on. Combination therapy is considered an optimal therapy for induction therapy. Adding the Dartumab, I think, makes a lot of sense. I really highly recommend that we need more focus on high-risk myeloma trials. Just high-risk myeloma will be very important. I am the person who actually think about if a patient have, and this is why I do my practice, some people might disagree with me, if a patient is standard risk, ineligible for transplant, Dix is my best option. And people ask me why. I tell them the Velcade and the neuropathy is the main reason. The Dartumab have a great quality of life. And sometimes I will tell you that, you know, I think patients, even uh, they go to remission, they drop the Revlimid, they keep the Dartumab more, although it's an injection comparing to oral pill. I'm biased about high-risk myeloma and still biased about that. In ineligible for transplant, I keep the proteasome inhibitor in high-risk myeloma. I, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any kind of, and I would like to hear Dr. Michael about his opinion about that, but my bias is coming from the fact is Dartumab really good in that, especially Dartumab, I like to maybe save it for later on because I know these patients are going to relapse as a second line, but I'm biased in, in newly diagnosed myeloma patients to use Belkid Revlimid. And I would like to stop here. <laughs> oh my, that was a lot of information. You guys really rocked this in the very first part of this. And thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Liu or Nurse Liu. I appreciate everything you just did. Uh, are we taking a break right now or are going to handle some questions? Uh, I, think, I think we could take some time for some questions. Uh, okay. Our speakers kept us on time. And so we've got a good 15 minutes of questions and we have uh, over almost 20 questions that have come in. So I think we can do a bit of a rapid fire answer here set, uh, Kelly, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I would think that'd be best for everyone. Thank you. All right, so let, let's just jump in here. Let me thank our speakers again for excellent, uh, a lot of information, as you said. So some of that may have been a little bit quick, a little bit over some of your heads, but hopefully uh, with the Q&A, we can make sure that we, we cover everything so that you feel comfortable with it. So. Uh, we'll try to keep our answers quick so that we can get through them, but I'll uh, share them between the three of us. So here's a question that says, is, is there any level of the P53 mutation considered high risk or is risk based on the percent of the P53 detected? So let me just clarify this. So when I had commented about what constitutes high risk versus standard risk disease, one of the things we do is we look at the genes of those plasma cells. You remember that we all get a, a gene from your one parent and a gene from your other parent. And so we have two copies of each one. And on chromosome 17, 
Uh, and each chromosome has what's called a long arm and a short arm. We call the P arm and the Q arm. That's why we call that, that old expression, mind your P's and Q's. That's, that's actually a genetic joke. Um, but um, on the P arm of chromosome 17 is a gene or a, a collection of proteins that dictates uh, something uh, that we call the P53 gene. And when that is either mutated or absent, that's a problem because what does cancer want to do? Cancer wants to become immortal. And this is a gene that normally keeps the cell in check and supervises it so it doesn't grow out of control. Um, and so when we see bone marrow reports that say, does someone have the P53 mutation or deletion? Basically, if it says that, we think of that as high risk. There is a little bit of a cutoff. We, we always discuss whether or not anything below 15 percent is really real, but even in someone where it may say, well, there's a 8% absence of it, uh, we tend to think of it as a higher risk disease. Um, here's a good question for you, Rebecca. What are some of the long-term concerns for taking dexamethasone? Yeah, so um, long-term steroid use can increase your risk of infection. It can increase your risk of cataracts. And so I, I think I saw a question about like blurred vision. A lot of times that's from the cataracts. Um, it can cause um, diabetes or organ, you know, steroid induced diabetes, um, things like that. And so what we really try to do is we try to get patients off steroids as soon as we can. Um, and I think the new field of thinking is um, tapering that sooner than later, especially with our newer drugs. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think uh, it's ironic. Just yesterday, the nurse practitioner that I have the privilege of working with, we just got noticed that we submitted an abstract to a meeting which was accepted, and we call it dialing down the dex, right? Mm -hmm. And we have a strategy of how we reduce people's dexamethasone. I really do think the field is going uh, in that direction. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, let me ask you, is there a genetic component to, my, to myeloma? Are family members of patients more likely to get myeloma? Uh, should we be screening for all family members and children with myeloma? I know this is a challenging question because it's not a simple answer, but, uh, but feel free to chime in a little bit about this. Uh, concept of genetic myeloma. Sure. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, I mean, you have maybe more experience in that regard. You know, I try as much as possible to look at all the strongest evidence and I have not find that. I know there is a lot of great studies to actually look at it. And I'm, uh, I know Dr. Gabrielle, she's uh, from Harvard. She's actually doing a really great job in that term. I don't have, uh, you know, big, I would say, kind of like strong feelings about that. Is there a really a strong genetic and honest opinion? What I really look at it is more environmental, especially here in Kansas. We have been seeing many patients, especially young age, getting myeloma, and we and we're related. It's just more about the exposure to some uh, chemicals, pesticides in these places. So this is one of the things I will say, uh, actually, that will be one of the things I will say it's more related more than it's actually, you know, genetic related. Because when I see the family members, they tell me that they actually have been working in that place or have been exposed in that in that field you know is there a component I, I heard like some people who say there was a small component but I have never recommended to um, do kind of like any kind of genetic studies unless they have other different cancers that I'm concerned about yeah I think that's fair I mean we don't really understand what causes myeloma is really the bottom line we know that there's some things that are associated with it exposure to agent orange exposure to uh, uh, certain toxic chemicals that you described. We know that firefighters, for example, have an increased incidence of myeloma. But we've also talked about people's inherent genetics, uh, people of African descent uh, having a greater risk of myeloma. There are some families that do have higher risk of myeloma and myeloma-related diseases within the family. It's not so common that we now plan to screen families in general or even just screen asymptomatic healthy people. Uh, we're doing a lot of studies in that. The IMF is very much involved with the ISTOP MM study, which is you know screened pretty much the whole island of Iceland to try and understand what puts people at risk of myeloma. But the short answer is that typically we don't screen family members if there are more than two family members with myeloma, then that could be a very reasonable approach because that may be one of the few families that we know of that have a greater incidence of myeloma, but it's not 
uh, very, very typical. Rebecca, here's a good question for you. Do hospitals generally have social workers to help navigate insurance and finances? Where can I go for help planning this part? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is talk to your um, your primary clinic team. They can make the referral for you to work with a social worker. Um, yes, hospitals should have social workers and they should be able to provide you with um, the resources and things like that. They can put you in touch with um, the financial clearance department um, to work out um, whatever, you know, however, however much the cost of the treatment is and how much insurance is paying and things like that. Yeah, and I, I think uh, in addition, I would just add, as Kelly noted early on in the in the workshop, we have an info line that people can access by phone or through email, and we can try and help direct to the right resources. Most centers, most clinics will have someone who can help navigate this, because this can be a very expensive and challenging journey, not just the financial side of it, but multiple ways of support. And so um, I, I'm, I'm glad you referenced that, because I really do think, I'm glad that, uh, that question was asked, because it is so absolutely important. Um, uh, Dr. Abdullah, here's a, a good question. Can a person with low risk myeloma uh, progress to high risk myeloma? Is, is that common? Uh, you know, I commented that about 25% of people have high risk myeloma and 75% have standard risk. Can someone with standard risk myeloma develop high risk myeloma over time? Unfortunately, yes. And that's one of the things that we have seen uh, commonly. And I, I, I know I think the more these patients, and this is what we see, the more these patients get. Uh, treatment and they relapse and you kind of like the only way to identify these patients is to do the bone marrow biopsy and check the fish and the cytogenetics and we have been seeing like this kind of risk that these patients were standard risk and they have developed to high risk like a secondary hit for these patients and unfortunately that is something uh, we think like you know uh, you know this actually could be hopefully finding a great treatment and better treatment and changing the treatment options in order to get these patients remission longer uh, uh, for that reason so uh, this is uh, this is what we see in my, my myeloma patients uh, I see low uh, the those patients who are standard risk less likely if they relapse to actually not transfer to the high risk myeloma yeah so you're you're absolutely right of course that we, we unfortunately can see that and that's one of the reasons why we have to constantly be monitoring uh, our patients through their myeloma journey. Uh, I think you've really addressed the issue of the vision loss, uh, Rebecca, so okay, there's a question someone's asking, is vi vision loss associated with the diagnosis of myeloma? Not typically the diagnosis of myeloma. Very, very rarely can myeloma affect the nerves that feed the eyes to cause a vision loss. Usually it's a blurriness of vision, uh, either from the steroids directly or through a cataract, as you've mentioned. Uh, but, but Rebecca, there is a question here, I think that is good for you that says, how, how, what do you recommend for leg or hand cramps? You know, we know that in particular when people are on longer term lenalidomide or Revlimid, they can get that cramping. Uh, do you have some suggestions for managing uh, leg or hand cramps? Yeah, so um, I've heard various things from my patients and the most popular one seems to be like salt, pickle juice, um, some electrolytes, things like that. So um, I think anything with like electrolytes, um, you can try and, you know, if you can stomach the pickle juice, you know, let me know how that works. But, um, you know, patients swear by it. Yeah, I'll, I'll sometimes say to folks, if you don't want pickle juice, um, uh, have a gin and tonic without the gin. Uh, so the tonic water, believe it or not, still has a bit of quinine in it. So, you know, we want to be careful with the volume of that. But yeah. uh, but sometimes people have uh, found that helpful, making sure that people remain very well hydrated. Uh, and if you are prone to getting those cramps, stretching before you go to bed at night can uh, sometimes be helpful as well. Um, we seem to have a lot of good questions about steroids. Someone says, steroids give me high blood sugar. Can metformin work uh, with that? And again, I think that's something that needs to be discussed with your with your physician. Um, we we do try to <clears throat> reduce the steroids that we said, so we don't causing the blood sugar to go up uh, to go up. But sometimes we need need to use them, uh, and there are different strategies. So all the same strategies that we typically take to diabetes, which may include metformin, may include insulin, may include dietary changes, and so on, uh, can, can potentially be uh, of of benefit. Um, um, other really good questions coming here, but uh, someone's asked about their insurance options for international patients trying to access treatment in the U.S. 
Uh, it's a complicated question and a challenging one, but but not an impossible one. It really depends on the jurisdiction you're coming from. There are some countries and some companies that can provide travel or specific insurance that may facilitate coverage here in the U.S. I do have to warn that tends to be very, very expensive. Uh, medical care here in the U.S. is is frankly quite expensive. Uh, uh, if you're in a country or jurisdiction that recognizes that they don't have access to a certain therapy uh, that maybe uh, can be available here. I know I originally was born and raised in Canada and there are some times where Canadian patients can come down to the U.S. and there's certain provisions with their insurance to have some covered uh, but that really has to be looked at in the home uh, jurisdiction. Um, uh, maybe a quick question for Dr. Abdella: Can daratumumab or Darzalex be used as a single agent? Well, I mean, I will be honest with you. I use it like single agent, but not upfront, like in relapsed myeloma and patients who are frail. You know, that's where I'll be honest with you. Like in with poor performance status, other comorbidities, and quite a bit. I'll tell you that was really well tolerated medication. So that's the only time. Other than that, I have not used it except in a in a combination therapy whether upfront or in relapsed myeloma but if they're really frail with poor performance status many comorbidities especially heart disease uh, these are the patients i will consider using the daratumumab as single agent yeah i agree wholly well uh, well well answered uh, rebecca for maintaining a healthy gut do you suggest a, a pre or a probiotic Sure, I think that's uh, fair. Um, you know, some patients like to take it to help, you know, prevent bloating and um, help um, with regular bowel movements. And, and I, th I think that's totally fine. You can try it. Of course, if you experience any adverse um, effects, you know, stop, let your healthcare provider know. But I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Abdel, I've got a good question here about vaccines. And I know this could be a long and involved question, but we'll just hit a few highlights here. Now, please provide a guideline for whether or not patients should be getting the flu shot as well as the COVID booster, as well as the RSV vaccine. Uh, and by the way, can you get them all on the same day in the same arm? Uh, should you be avoiding them when you're on treatment? Or what's your, in Kansas, what's your typical approach to vaccinations of your myeloma patients? I, I totally kind of encourage these patients to get the vaccines, uh, mainly I don't encourage them to get it on the same day. You know, some patients like tend to have, be a little bit sick. But I think the best question here is, I think, when they say, do you avoid it on daratumumab? I really tend to avoid it on the day they get the daratumumab or that week, you know. Take that week off and give the treatment. Happened a couple of times that patients got the vaccine, have some kind of weird reaction. And it was, I think it was a reaction between the vaccine and the daratumumab. With the Revlimid, I don't have any, uh, any objections with that reaction. But um, I kind of like uh, encourage these patients to get these vaccines. The RSV is a new vaccine, so um, we are going to see how uh, we're encouraging our patient because we unfortunately so many cases of RSV pneumonia last year, and I'm one of those who hate to deal with that because you you know, Michael, how bad these uh, disease, the pneumonia is. Some of these patients, unfortunately, they go to the ICU, so my preference is to take the vaccines there. Uh, but the daratumumab, I'll say the only thing is that if they're off the treatment or in a week off, I'll, I tend to use it just a couple of cases. I have some patients who got bad reaction. I assume it was a, 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 an interaction between the vaccine and the daratumumab. Yeah, it's, it's always a challenging situation, right? Where, where yeah. we know that myeloma patients are at high risk of infection. We know that myeloma patients, when given vaccines, may not have the same vigorous response that we would expect uh, uh, an individual without myeloma to have, which I think emphasizes even more so the importance of being vaccinated, especially with the flu shot, especially with COVID. We're still sorting out the details, as you've mentioned, with RSV. Uh, Rebecca nicely said in her talk that we, we should be avoiding live vaccines, and these ones, thankfully, are not live uh, vaccines. Um, and so I do think, obviously, it requires a discussion with your uh, provider team, but I do think that in general, uh, we saw, thankfully, I think a significant reduction in the burden of COVID, for example, uh, in those who had had a, a COVID shot. And our time's going quickly. I'll answer a couple of these. There's a situation. Thank you for this individual who shared um, a bit of their story, being quite young, diagnosed at the age of 37 three, year, three years ago. And the question is, what experience have you seen with younger patients with myeloma um, I have a particular interest in this area. I've had the privilege of taking care of many, many patients, very young, under 30, under 20, 
uh, went to Latin America once to meet to meet the youngest person ever diagnosed, at least that we know of, with myeloma, a young boy at the age of eight. Um, I, I would say that as we see with older patients with myeloma, we are seeing improvement in survival. We are seeing, you know, that same distribution of high risk versus standard risk. But you know, if I tell a 75 year old patient tomorrow, look, I, I expect you to live more than 10 years. That's rather encouraging. If I see a 25 year old patient tomorrow and I say you're gonna live 10 years, that's not very encouraging. So I do think that's a little bit of a different strategy is followed in, in the very, very young, where we really wanna be careful that we don't expose patients to drugs that can cause longer term challenges and toxicities. Uh, but we are seeing some great outcomes with, you know, historically with transplant and now with introducing things like CAR T cell therapies and others. So um, it, it's it's a tough road because um, as we heard before, we're not significantly cure, uh, not cur uh, curing a significant fraction of myeloma patients, but we do have many patients now uh, and through our great support network through the IMF, we, we see many patients that are living 20, 30 and even more years. All right, we're going to take a break in just a moment. Just quickly answer one. There was someone who wrote and said, I had a brochure once, a notebook from the IMF. Can I find it online? Oh, yes, you can. Uh, Kelly showed that huge list of booklets. There's so many things that can be accessed there. Um, and uh, I think what it'll do is I'll defer some of the other questions. One of them had to do with maintenance therapy, so we'll wait till we have the maintenance therapy talk. Uh, and Kelly, I'll include some of these questions after, but miracle upon miracle, we're actually five minutes early, uh, but I think it's probably good for everybody to get up and walk around and take a little break, uh, but I'll turn it back to you, Kelly, to direct us as to when you want us back, I assume uh, in about 10 or 12 minutes from now. About 10, everyone take a stretch, move your arms around, move your hand around, because I know you've been taking a lot of notes. So take 10 minutes and we'll see you shortly. Welcome back. I hope you had a little walk around, a little stretch, maybe a, uh, well, no soda. That's not good for you. How about some quinine water or just some water? That's what we were talking about earlier. Well, okay, we're going to get into the lightning round right now. Get your notepad out, get your pen and pencil. We're going into maintenance therapy, Allah, and you're going to really enjoy this. And then we go into Dr. McHale's for relapse therapy and clinical trials. Take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly, and uh, uh, welcome again. And today I'm going <clears> to, <throat> after this, <clears throat> after uh, talking about frontline therapy, I'm going to talk about maintenance therapy. And I think most of the patients know about maintenance therapy, so we are going to discuss about the reason why we do the maintenance therapy is to try to keep the patients in remission as long as possible. The goal is to avoid these patients to relapse after a while, you know, and keep them in response. And hopefully, you know, we will find many answers about some clinical trials and we were going to talk about that in the near future. So I'm just going to go through that. What are the objectives of this is to discuss the maintenance therapy and the applications, uh, the outline of the major options for maintenance therapy. We're going to discuss about that and we'll discuss the newer trends for use of dual maintenance therapy. This is going to be a, a controversial uh, subject because still we are trying to determine the importance of that as well. But what is maintenance therapy? Because we keep asking ourselves. It's really a less intense treatment that we use, but for longer term. You know, countries like France, they use it for one year, but in the US, we really use it actually. And, and then there's a lot of people who use it, um, you know, for more than four or five years, and some physicians who still use it until they progress. And we try to achieve a better uh, remission for these patients and longer survival with, with a goal of keeping the quality of life important for these patients and to avoid these patients to have relapsed myeloma. And the ideal maintenance therapy looks like, in our opinion, is a deeper remission. So sometimes the patient will not achieve achieve a deeper remission after transplant and induction therapy. And it might take them a year or two years, as you can see from the Griffin trial, that the remission rate actually improved after maybe a year of maintenance therapy. And that's our big goal, the ideal maintenance therapy that we call prolonged remission, not only getting into remission, keeping the patient in remission as long as possible that can actually improve eventually what we believe a survival for these patients. Easily administer, uh, that's also important because we're not talking about three months of treatment. We're talking about years of treatment in many of the cases. My preference is always oral instead of injection or IV that the patient will not have to come to the cancer center most of the time. And of course, minimum toxicity in order to make the patient's 
better quality of life. So the first maintenance therapy that we use, I'm not going to talk about historically which one was the first, is most of the patients that commonly use this Revlimid, the oral immune modulatory drug. Very amazing drug, but why did we use it? A lot of patients ask me after stem cell transplant, especially those who go to complete remission, why do we have to be on a treatment after transplant? And I think it's reasonable to answer that question that not only one or two studies, many studies, they actually evaluate after transplant either to give Revlimid or use placebo, no, no, not giving any treatment. And they randomized these patients in this one of the studies, founding that these patients stayed in remission longer with using the Revlimid, especially after three years, although the survival was not that big difference in this group. So there was a benefit in this particular study of using Revlimid over not using it after transplant. Another study also, the IFM study, was also comparing Revlimid versus placebo. And it also showed the same thing. There was a benefit in staying in remission using the Revlimid over the placebo without any overall survival benefit. The myeloma 11 study was quite a bit there, but it also was huge study it involved those who got transplant and those who didn't get transplant. But they compared Revlimid versus observation in these cases. And you can see that the difference in re response or uh, in a deeper response to staying in remission was better in those patients who got Revlimid comparing to, re uh, to, uh, to uh, placebo or observation. However, nobody really gave a great answer about the overall survival because people say, well, so you want to keep me in remission longer, but I'm not going to live longer and I have to be on a treatment like Revlimid for a long period of time. Well, the answer is no, there was some analysis about the study and they look at it longer because most of these patients you see four or five years. This was a very great analysis that they saw. After seven years, there was a split between the Revlimid and observation. And you can see there was 62% stayed in, uh, you know, have a survival versus 50%. So there was a 12% differences. But if you wanna actually be very accurate in this case, to, the, the differences actually was representing about two and a half years for those who got Revlimid versus those who got observation. So when I talk to patients, honest opinion, this is what I really use. Not only that I want to keep you in remission, that also there is a bigger chance that you also can, you know, survive longer if you use Revlimid as maintenance therapy. However, there's always one of the major concerns of the side effects of the Revlimid. It's not like as to say, it's a great drug, immuno type of immunotherapy drug, I will call it, but also have side effects. One of the commonest and most commonest question I get asked about the secondary cancers. Secondary cancers could be things like blood cancers, skin cancers, solid cancers. And although it's not very common, like 5% and a little bit more that these patients can get secondary cancers from the Revlimid, we ask ourselves, what is the benefit of doing it? Is it worth it to do it or not? And this is a summary, I'll say, that the rate, if you don't get Revlimid versus observation, that you have a 35% chance to die uh, from myeloma if you don't get Revlimid versus less than 5% chance to die from a second cancer if you got Revlimid. So that is exactly what the reason is that the benefit of the Revlimid outweighed the risk in this case. So I always advise the patients, why are we using it? And I know the risk of the second cancers. And advice as I tell the patients is to see a dermatologist for skin cancer, keep up to date with the screening test in order to make sure. And we also evaluate their blood test for a possibility if they get any, which is a small percentage, getting any blood cancer. Now, a lot of people will ask about the, uh, you know, the duration of this, and, and unfortunately, there's no right answer for now. There's a lot of clinical trials, uh, and there's people who have different opinions about that. Some institutions do it until they progress, and some institutions do it, and they use a test, that minimal residual disease test, in order to see if we can stop the treatment. And, you know, they evaluate if the patient have high risk or standard risk. Another option, like, not everybody can get Revlimid, and there might be reasons, might be rash, might be side effects. So I always try to tend to see what other options and financial problem is also sometimes a big issue for some of the patients. Like when they receive a copay of one thousand or two thousand dollars a month, they have to pay. They might not be able to, you know, afford that. Velcade or pertuzumab is one of the options, and I want to actually highlight this study where they compare. Velcade after induction therapy with thalidomide, the older version of Revlimid, and say that there was 
a better progression-free survival and some overall survival for these patients. An honest opinion, even if it was similar, I kind of use that as an excuse. If I can't give patient Rivlimid, Velcate will be a good option for my myeloma patients as an alternative for that. However, you know, some people have different ways to use it. My, you know, plan for these patients, I don't use steroids with them, but I use only Velcate every other week shot for these patients as maintenance therapy. The third option that I will say I actually kind of like commonly use, maybe it's like a third uh, possibility, is the daratumumab. Daratumumab as the maintenance therapy, there have been a lot of questions that what's the evidence. I use the Casubia study as a proof of evidence. Of course, the Negriffin trial is doublet versus single, but the Casubia study, although it's not the typical that we use in the United States, they actually did the Dara Velke Thaldomide Dix, which we do only Revlimid Dix. And they did transmit for these patients and randomized them uh, either to get uh, eventually daratumab alone or observation, uh, which also is not typical because we use uh, an immune modulatory drugs. But it was a good study to actually know exactly the impact of daratumab as a maintenance therapy. Now, overall, there was a great difference in those who got daratumab, which was not surprising, what we saw in the Griffin study, and some benefit overall survival. But the one thing I wanted to talk about is this, this line that shows the importance of using daratumab, mainly the daratumab in maintenance therapy comparing to observation. There was a big difference in terms of staying in remission. Not only response rate was better, but also staying in remission. And I use that as an excuse if I can't give the patient Revlimid or Velcid, the daratumab will be a good, a good option as single agent. But again, because it's an injection therapy, you know, I opt maybe not to use it, you know, very often to just to use the best option, which is oral uh, treatment. Now, the biggest controversial, to be honest with you, is the high-risk myeloma. And I'm going to be very straightforward. Do we have really strong studies? The only major study I really think I, I, I have a lot of great retrospective study, phase two study, but the biggest uh, perspective study, randomized trial that we have is the phase two study where they compare in high risk myeloma, only high risk myeloma, adding a monoclonal antibody, not the daratumab, the elotuzumab, which is another uh, type of uh, antibody, monoclonal antibody with Revlimid Velcade Dix versus Revlimid Velcade Dix. So first, these patients did get transmit, and then they followed by maintenance therapy. I think this study is kind of the closest that we have for high risk myeloma. But I cannot see that the three drug regimen was equivalent to the four drug regimen in this case, in terms of these patients staying in remission longer, in terms of survival. So I use that as an excuse that the Velcade and Revlimid are good treatments as maintenance therapy in myeloma, in addition to many other retrospective and phase two studies that shows the importance of the Velcade and the Revlimid in this case. Some people might have a different opinion about that, but I think one of the things, uh, this is one of the cases i really take it seriously like patients who got uh, two different cytogenetics you know abnormalities i really start there's patients on treatment on day 60 and start these patients on a doublet therapy which is velcade and revlimid and most of the time i really you know opt op to omit uh, the dexamethasone and avoid doing that for these patients the common questions I get asked, you know, during uh, any clinic office visit is about should post-transplant uh, maintenance therapy be recommended all patients? I do recommend it. There is some exceptions, uh, you know, but I always do actually give these patients all, even if they're MRD negative, I still give them the maintenance therapy. Um, I, my recommendation, which agent to use is really relevant for as a standard of care, especially for those uh, standard risk patients. And the duration, I think it's always negotiable about that, but I do it until patient progress disease uh, as a standard of care. But some people are using now MRD testing, and it's really depend on what the physician and the patient can talk about the benefit of using it. There's a lot of upcoming trials that are going to answer about the duration of this type of treatment. Um, in my, you know, I have a question about the high risk cytogenetics. I really talk about Rivlimid and Pertizome inhibitor. I really still do it, although there's not big, big evidence about that, but that's one of the practices I do here in Kansas. Clinical trials, I highly recommend that because I think that will answer a lot of our questions. And MRD status dictate maintenance therapy. I think it's too early to talk about it. I do it only in special occasions. Patients have low burden disease. Uh, in, in the beginning of diagnosis and standard risk. Um, in high-risk myeloma, I really don't use MRD to define if I need to pay, uh, pay, uh, stop the maintenance or not uh, in, in these cases. 
And again, my, my answer for the commonest question about secondary primary cancers is that I really believe that there is real, it's, there is a small percentage, but the death from myeloma itself, if you're not on Revlimid, is higher comparing to the secondary cancers. So I always recommend to kind of use it. And I think the conclusion is the same as uh, these questions I just, you know, about, um, you know, to consider maintenance therapy and Revlimid, in my opinion, is considered as a, a main option for these patients. And I think, you know, it, it, the benefit of using Revlimid outweigh the risk duration of the treatment is still, is still a lot of uh, questions about it. And hopefully we'll have more answers, definitive answers about how long you really need to keep the patients on Revlimid. Uh, other options is Velcade Daratumab, um, Carfilzomab. I do not prefer to use it. It's just because IV drug and uh, get worried about side effects, but my preference is these three options. And high risk, I really still consider using the double treatment, using double treatment, using two drugs, uh, proteasome inhibitor, mostly Velcade, and IMEDS, which is Revlimid in this case. And thank you very much. Wow, you took my breath away there for a second. That was wonderful. Thank you for your uh, presentation and the co conclusions. Now we're going to go right into, uh, oh, look at that, optional one and, and and dinner, that's what we're going to go into, and cable TV. Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. So uh, I know there's a lot of, a uh, bit of an information overload tonight, but hopefully um, as we uh, think about this last two lectures that uh, we can wrap some things together and get to the questions that uh, thank you, thank you for those who've been asking them uh, that you have been submitting to us. So we talked from the very start that unfortunately this is a disease that typically comes back. Uh, despite what we've shared with these great frontline therapies that Dr. Abdullah shared with us and the maintenance therapy thereafter, unfortunately, typically the disease will come back at some point. And so as we think about relapse, uh, myeloma and clinical trials. We'll talk a little bit about those together. I see that we've jumped right into the clinical trials, which is great. Um, so when we talk about clinical trials, people tend to um, uh, sometimes get a bit nervous about this discussion. And so I just want us to be open and honest about how we approach trials and think about them carefully together. That, uh, you know, research as we have talked so much already about research tonight, research is really what has moved the field forward. Without research, we wouldn't have all those drugs that we showed on our list earlier. We wouldn't have had that opportunity to uh, really demonstrate that um, uh, we've had such a, a massive uh, change in the therapies available to us um, that we didn't have before. But no one is expected to be a guinea pig. Um, um, where we think, oh, we're just going to do this. There's going to be no benefit to you. You're just sort of donating your, your goodness so that we can uh, benefit others. Yes, there may be benefit to others, but there should be a potential anticipated benefit and more often than not, absolutely expected benefit for a patient who, are, who is undergoing a clinical trial. Thankfully, uh, despite the terrible history, and I'll make comment of it earlier later, uh, of, the, of some of the awful things that have happened in our history, we really do have research under a very tight supervision and standards that we believe is going to facilitate better care of our patients. And if there's one message I want to leave with you through this whole discussion is that open, clear, and honest communication between the healthcare team and the patient is fundamental. Uh, a lot of misconceptions come because there hasn't been that good uh, communication. As I mentioned from the very start, um, we've demonstrated in oncology that good communication actually improves uh, not only patients' experience, but ultimately their survival. So you might say, well, why would I want to do a clinical trial? And everybody has to be viewed uniquely. No one's going to say to force you to participate in one, but there are benefits. And more often than not in myeloma, the benefit is this first one listed here, which is early access to new therapy. So a therapy that has not yet been fully FDA approved, but is being studied in clinical trial, that's demonstrating promise and, <clears throat> excuse me, and benefit, often our patients get early access to that. And a lot of our patients are alive today because of that. And in doing so, we can delay the standard therapy. Like we may have other options. We know we can give you no matter what. So if the clinical trial works, great. If it doesn't work, we have these other options. It delays that. And as we've shown in a disease that we're not really curing a large 
majority of patients, uh, we want to be able to defer things as long as possible. Uh, and of course, there is altruistic methods here that we contribute to the myeloma world, um, both present and future. But also, this is another fourth important point based on, in particular, that one question that was asked about financial concerns, is that um, sometimes once an agent is fully approved and so on, there may be some financial challenges. But typically in clinical trials, people are not being charged for the clinical trial drug. They, there may be charges for the usual standard of care that may accompany that. So, but there may be in certain situations a financial benefit. Now that's gotta be balanced with risks. You know, Dr. Abdullah nicely said, look, there's no drug that comes without risk. Right, uh, unless it's mother's milk, pretty much everything comes with a risk uh, of any treatment we would give. And so we have to recognize that there could be side effects or toxicities as we call them, and there may not be a benefit. Now, sometimes we, not every clinical trial we've ever done a myeloma that turns out to be positive. We know that some of them can indeed be negative. Um, and so why are clinical trials important as, as part of the research spectrum? Because that's what helps us translate all the great work that gets done in a lab and that we evaluate it, that brings it to the patient. And we design a clinical trial to answer a specific question, right? In the ones that, that uh, Dr. Abdullah just showed, you know, does it make benefit? Does it make sense to add a fourth drug to these three drugs that we're giving? Does it make sense to stay on Revlimid longer or shorter? Those kinds of things are the kinds of questions that we want to answer. And so as a drug gets developed, we're typically in the lab um, studying uh, uh, various aspects of myeloma. We have myeloma cells that we can grow in the lab, uh, sometimes with animal models, and we're studying, trying to understand, does the, is there, you know, we I showed earlier that the myeloma cell on the outside of it, for example, has all these targets. Sometimes we don't even know what these targets do, but we know that it's something we could potentially grab onto. And so we want to evaluate that, and we study that in the lab. And then we confirm the potential benefit in, in the lab studies and sometimes in animal studies, and then we bring it to humans, where we have, as I'm gonna show you in a moment, we often call the first in human clinical trials, where we wanna make sure the drug is safe, we wanna help evaluate the right dose, <clears throat> excuse me, the dose of the drug, and then to see how uh, effective it is. And of course, this takes a lot of time and money to do that. So even before we get to humans, we often have to do uh, studies in the lab through what we call cell lines, uh, which we sometimes use the phrase in vitro, so it's it's in a tube, it's not in a patient. And, and I know this might creep out some of you, but you're a lot more like a mouse than you might think. Um, our genetic makeup is not that dissimilar to mice, so sometimes we do studies in mice to understand it, and then we're about to bring it into patients in what we call the first in human study. And that's part of, as we're going to see on this slide, a phase one study. So a phase one study is not so much trying to see how well a drug works, but really understanding its safety, because sometimes there is a difference between what we see in the lab and even in a, in a mouse or an animal model compared to what we see in humans. And I do a lot of phase one studies, so I know this requires a very careful conversation with the patient because we're like, we, we have to say, look, we may be using lower doses than we might think is very effective. It may work at this dose. We try to choose doses that we know are going to be a benefit, but sometimes we have some dose adjustments. Phase two is after we've determined in a phase one study what is, if you will, the right dose or the expected right dose, how well is it working? And so we typically study that in a larger proportion of patients. And then ultimately, we try to bring most of our drugs to what's called the phase three trial, or now we're doing a comparison, generally speaking, between what has historically been the standard of care and now what we're adding. So for example, for example, Dr. Abdullah mentioned that one of his uh, most liked studies was the Griffin trial. And in that trial, we added Darzalex or Daratumumab to the three drugs that we typically use in frontline myeloma for patients going to transplant of RVD or Revlimid Velcadexmethasone. And so the study was designed, that was actually a phase two study, but the principle of comparing uh, the standard of care to uh, the, new, uh, the new model. So in phase one studies, then patients are receiving, everyone's getting the experimental dose, uh, the experimental drug, we're trying to determine the right dose. And this is really the first step towards those higher phase studies. By the time we get to phase two, as I've mentioned, we're often using it either by itself or in combination, and we're trying to see how effective it is. Whereas when we get to a phase three, this is the highest level 
<clears throat> of evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, if you will, towards um, an approval of a drug where uh, there may be uh, what's called a randomization where there's where when someone enters the trial, they don't know which arm they're going to go into or which treatment they're going to get. There may be a placebo, but it's not a placebo, meaning that's all you're going to get. Uh, uh, very rarely is it ever that. Um, only if receiving the placebo is the standard of care. In the early trials, for example, in maintenance therapy, we didn't know if maintenance therapy was going to work or not. So we did compare nothing to getting maintenance therapy. Well, now that we know maintenance works, we can now do different studies where we compare one drug versus two drug, for example as a phase three trial. There are some other kinds of trials, and for the sake of time tonight, I won't go into a lot of detail around them, but we can do different kinds of studies where we evaluate uh, larger groups of patients. And, and so a clinical trial uh, are, a clinical trials are um, housed in what we call a protocol. So a protocol is kind of a description of all that's going to happen in that trial. And it talks about why the trial is needed, what's going to happen, what drugs are being given. This is usually a pretty thick document. More often than not, if you want access to the to that, uh, patients typically can see at least uh, most of it. But what but where it is really important is trying to understand what that benefit could be of participating in, in that trial, which as we've mentioned, at least getting the standard of care and maybe access to newer therapy. But again, I just want to emphasize this one more time that there are risks, um, that that risk uh, uh, can be uh, side effects from the drug, it not working. Uh, and there are some health insurance plans that make it a little bit difficult to do clinical trials. And so that may uh, cause trouble. In the hist historically, there have been fewer patients than we might have expected entering clinical trials. And I think this is changing. I think people are starting to feel more comfortable with them, but usually it's because people are unaware of it or they're, they don't have access. They may live in an area or region where there isn't a larger center that are doing tri uh, trials. Uh, they may distrust or be suspicious of research in the healthcare system. And that is justified, frankly, historically, although we're trying, as I mentioned, to overcome that. There may be financial concerns. They, they, <clears throat> may feel generally disconnected from their healthcare team. Uh, and that uh, goes back to what I said earlier about uh, that comfort. Particular where we've seen a big disparity in myeloma is the lack of what we call diversity in clinical trials, meaning knowing that myeloma is twice as common, for example, in the African-American population, that means that about one in five patients in this country with myeloma are of African descent, about 20% of all patients. But if historically we look at clinical trials, in particular key clinical trials, the average rate of participation from African-American patients is probably about 5 to 8%. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons for that. Um, uh, uh, and it affects the way we think about these drugs because we want all patients and races to derive the benefit from these trials. And if we don't have the diversity of the population of trial, we don't know how applicable that trial, if you will, is to all the races, ethnicities that may have been omitted in the participation of that trial. But of course, we have to go back to the drivers of this. You know, there, there are reasons for this underrepresentation, and it, it's complicated. And it can be as high level as systemic racism or, or access uh, to clinical trials, uh, but also our, us as the medical community not being as sensitive to uh, this issue and the importance of building that trust within uh, every community. So when a trial is presented to you, it's typically presented in what we call informed consent because we need every, we need someone's consent or agreement to go on to the trial, but we don't just say, hey, you want to do this trial? Just trust me, I'm your doctor. We don't say that. We, we want you to be informed, and the informed consent should outline very clearly the details of the trial, what are the anticipated uh, risks that could be common or that could be severe, and also the potential benefits. So when you... Um, uh, meet with your doctor or their team to talk about trials. Uh, here are just some questions, and you know these slides are going to be available to you afterwards, as we've said, that you can ask, and like questions like, how does the study drug work? Uh, what benefits can I expect? Can I still take my vitamins when I'm doing this? Uh, will my insurance pay, pay for this? Uh, those are the kinds of questions that can be helpful as, as people go through. Because there are misconceptions. I've tried to cover most of these earlier on, but you know, someone thinks, oh, I'm, I'm just going to get a sugar pill. 
uh, we, we don't really give sugar pills. I mentioned placebo is rarely used in myeloma and people have to at least been given the standard of care. Uh, and, and that's why we don't treat people, as we say, like guinea pigs. Um, uh, and uh, some people think that we only ever do clinical trials when uh, there's nothing left. Like I'm only gonna think about a clinical trial when I've tried absolutely everything else. Well, that's not the case. In myeloma, we have clinical trials all through the spectrum of the disease from frontline therapy to relapse therapy. So if you're thinking about a clinical trial, talk to your physician about whether you're eligible. Uh, try to understand what is the best trial for you. You'll get a chance to meet the clinical research nurse and trials coordinator, and that can give you much more detail and really look carefully through that, uh, that uh, consent. Now, the good news is in myeloma, um, and I was joking earlier about uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah and Rebecca being in uh, utero when I started in myeloma, but you know, doing myeloma now for about 25 years, I, I can honestly say I've never seen a year like this year. When I just see the volume of clinical trials that are going on, I gave you a quick overview earlier of CAR T cell therapy and what it's involved with. Um, and now we're working on even better CAR T cell products. And could we do CAR T cell therapy where I don't have to collect a patient's T cells, where I can just have, if you will, T cells off the shelf that I use? Not that we're you know selling T cells at Costco, but you know, can we get cells uh, that are made that can do the kinds of things that we see with CAR T cell therapy? These bispecifics that we've mentioned, those two arm drugs that hook onto the myeloma and hook onto uh, a local T cell, uh, we're learning that we can use different targets and even different cells. Up to now, we've been focusing on T cells. I have a clinical trial, for example, in my clinic where we're using a natural killer cell as the cell that we're engaging. I don't know about you, a natural killer cell sounds pretty, pretty tough. Um, you know, I want to involve those guys uh, because they uh, may well really help destroy the myeloma. And we have all sorts of new molecules, something called cell mods, which have just been uh, making a big splash this week in the medical community, uh, which are sort of newer versions, if you will, of the immunomodulatory drugs we have, a new class of drugs there, uh, and many, many other drugs uh, along the way are coming. Now, before we jump to that, oh, I see that some of my slides for the relapse disease aren't there, uh, Kelly, but that's okay, because we have uh, so many good questions that I know we can take up a little bit more of the time on those. Um, I will just maybe uh, quickly uh, state a couple of things before we jump to the Q&A which is that um, as, as was so nicely pointed out from um, uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah that, you know, we give maintenance therapy after a transplant or we give continuous therapy in patients not going to transplant so that we can have people in remission for as long as possible. But unfortunately, at some point, the disease is going to uh, come back. And at that point, we want to sit down and say, what are our options? And myeloma is not so simple anymore that we just say, well, when the disease comes back, we always do this or we always do that. It's not about that. We match all those drugs that I was talking about earlier and we match them to the patient. And we typically divide relapse therapy into two groups. Is someone in what we so, so called early relapse? So they're still in the first few lines of therapy or late relapse. And right now we have all sorts of great clinical trials that have been done in early relapse that guide our therapy. And typically we're using three drug combinations from those different classes and mixing them together. That's one of the things we've learned in myeloma. Just like we've learned in HIV, for example, we didn't overcome HIV just because we found one magic drug. It's because we found the right combination of drugs. And so that's typically what we're doing in early relapse of combining drugs together. Whereas in late relapse, this is where we're using all these newer treatments that we have, the CAR T cell therapies, as I described them, the bispecific antibodies, as I've described them. And we're really seeing unprecedented response rates. You know, historically, the drugs that we saw um, uh, that have been approved in relapse myeloma, if they worked in over 20 to 25% of people with very heavily pretreated myeloma, that would lead to that drug's approval. Now we're seeing with bispecific antibodies, response rates over 60%. And with CAR T cell therapy, uh, we're seeing over 90, and in some cases over 95% response rate. 
So that picture I showed you at the start that the longest remission is the first remission, that may change with time as we do these, uh, introduce these new therapies. And we have patients alive today and living much longer with myeloma because of CAR T cell therapy, because of bispecifics. And then my last point is gonna be, even though we use those newer treatments, the CAR T and the bispecifics in late relapse, we're now doing the clinical trials to move them earlier on in relapse, where we are, and we've just had two very important studies done with the two CAR T cell therapies that we now have approved, and we are able to use them earlier in the disease course. Uh, uh, by the clinical trials, not yet been FDA approved, but almost definitely within the next year, we're going to be able to use these treatments like Abecma and Carvicti that we've heard about earlier in the disease course. And maybe even up front, I know that uh, Dr. Abdullah is a transplanter and I want to be careful I don't offend the transplanters because I'm a transplanter too, but you know, I'm just opening a trial on my site where patients are getting randomized to a stem cell transplant or CAR T cell therapy. And uh, uh, we may someday be able to replace CAR T or replace a transplant, or at least in addition to transplant, consider CAR T cell therapy in a lot of our patients uh, in the frontline setting. So um, I, I really think that this is the golden age of myeloma, Kelly. I've never seen it in all the years that I've worked in myeloma that we have as many options, not just immediately available to patients, but also in the pipeline coming. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important that we talk about uh, these clinical trials uh, as we go through. Now, We've been given a lot of questions. Oh, sorry, Kelly, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say we have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of questions here. So I will get, uh, 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 you know, I'm just the, the appetizer for the main dish here of Rebecca <laughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start getting some questions to them. Um, and I know that you addressed this in the lecture, uh, Dr. Abdullah, but just as a quick reminder to patients, someone's asking really how long should someone be on maintenance therapy? Is this something where we tell patients you're gonna take it and you're gonna like it and you're gonna stay <laughs> forever? Um, um, uh, uh, that's not exactly yeah. the first time we speak I mean, to patients, but, but how yeah. long do you typically put keep your patients on lenalidomide maintenance, for example? Yeah, yeah, that's really a great question. I think that's one of the things I keep trying to argue with my patients about it. But you know, lately I have been changing uh, the practice, although there's not strong evidence but if a patient have high risk, to be honest with you, uh, Dr. Michael, I, I keep the patient on the treatment for a long period of time, even if they're MRD negative. I have that, um, especially if they're double hit uh, high risk. Standard risk, honest opinion, I have been actually lately doing the following. If the patient is on maintenance and let's say after three to four years, they're still in remission and MRD is negative, I consult with them and I talk to them actually in more details and give them the option about you know stopping the treatment or versus continuing the treatment. And I will let them make that decision based on that, you know, and tell them that really we don't have a strong evidence. There is really ongoing studies. So standard risk, I have started to actually use the MRD testing. Um, you know, if the patient is specially willing to consider stopping the revival, we have stopped it based on our discussion with the patients. Um, and I think it's just kind of like, I think that is the part of, I'm hoping the dramatic trial, for example, will give us a very great hint about how to actually utilize the MRD exactly when, like, you know, they're using the two years, uh, for example. I'm hoping that we'll have a really good cut, you know, for that, because I think that's our in my opinion, that's our issue. We really don't have a strong evidence, but some people have different opinion about that. Mine is that standard risk, use MRD testing and talk to the patient and be very transparent with them about that, you know, so they are aware about, uh, we are still waiting for more studies in order for this, but high risk myeloma patients, honest opinion. I know there's great studies from the master trial. I'm a little bit biased and skeptical. I still keep them on the doublet therapy, uh, give them breaks, but I still keep them on that, to be honest with you. I think that's a very fair answer, a very balanced approach. You know, Rebecca, on this issue of maintenance therapy, you know, one of the challenges we've seen, whether it's in clinical trials or clinical practice, uh, and I think it's an important number, that, that roughly about a third of patients have to come off maintenance therapy, not because, you know, of MRD negativity or of a change in their disease, but they just can't tolerate the drug, even though a drug like Revlimid on the whole is pretty well tolerated. There are patients that have side effects that we try to reduce, uh, but still become a problem. And, and perhaps the most common ones we see with Revlimid is that, that people get ongoing fatigue, 
they get uh, a diarrhea uh, or they get cramping. We talked a bit about the cramping earlier. And I just wonder from a supportive care standpoint, if you can reiterate again to us, you know, what strategies when someone's on Revlimid maintenance can we take when they're having ongoing fatigue or diarrhea? What is your sort of approach to those two things? Yeah, so um, definitely the Revlimid um, related diarrhea can be very debilitating. I have patients who are afraid to go out to go do their grocery shopping because they're afraid that they have to, ha you know, you know, go to the restroom. Um, and so one of the things that I start with my patients is, you know, certainly you can try the Imodium, the over-the-counter stuff. Um, if that doesn't work, we can try um, you have bile acid sequestrant, so like drugs like colosavalum. Um, and that tends to help the patients pretty well. Um, I think that uh, one of the biggest things is patients are having diarrhea, want to stay hydrated um, because, of course, you're going to be losing a lot of fluids and we don't want to um, cause problems with that. But um, the other thing, you know, especially with managing fatigue, I would say um, it's, it seems counterintuitive, but like increasing activity um, actually um, has been found to be helpful. So, you know, walking, doing small um, exercises and um, things like that. Um, and, you know, I would just keep your um, physician informed because there are things that they can do with your regimen to help manage these uh, side effects. So typically the typical maintenance course is your 21 days on and um, eight, uh, seven days off, right? Um, so there's things that they can do to increase that break or, you know, reduce the dose of Revlimid. Um, a lot of times, you know, patients are fatigued because their counts are low. And, um, you know, when we take Revlimid, it's cyclical. You, you know, start off okay. And then as the drug accumulates, you start to feel really bad. And so that seven-day break is really key for patients to kind of regain their, you know, energies and, um, yeah, their, their um, yeah, quality of life back, so. Yeah, no, I think you've, you've hit a lot of the high points that, that often we make a dose adjustments, especially for the fatigue. I've often found if, if someone's on 15 milligrams, go down to 10. If they're on 10, we can go down to five. That can often reduce the diarrhea as well. And other supportive care measures, as you discussed, you know, anti-diarrheals. And, uh, but there are some patients, unfortunately, where it just persists. So we just can't stop it. And I think it is, is important to recognize that. Um, here's a good question for you, uh, Dr. Abdullah, about... Um, what does research show when comparing relapse rate with DARA RVD and no uh, um, transplant versus having a transplant? I guess is the is the question here. Is that do you think that the quadruplets? And I know we don't have the answer yet, but do you think using four drugs is going to obviate the need of us doing transplant? Like term, newly diagnosed myeloma patients? Correct. Correct. Um, it's really a great question. I I really think we don't have a great answer. I think there have been a lot of argument because we're reaching to the point that we have a lot of MRD negativity that, you know, it's making it easier to see that these patients might not need transplant. But I really think, and, uh, you know, with all due my respect to that question, I think the CAR T will be the best answer, you know, with the clinical trial. And I, honest opinion, I'm a little bit biased toward the CAR T. And there's a reason that, Dr. Michael, the only treatment that actually beat it at triplet therapy was CAR-T in the CARMA-3 and the CAR-T2 trial. So I think the CAR-T might be able to actually end up that big argument, which can replace the stem cell transplant. Uh, the question is going to be what induction therapy we're going to use prior to the CAR-T if that happened. So I don't know exactly how long we will see uh, until we see the great results. But until now, I really think even if we go to complete remission, I highly recommend still to continue the stem cell transplant as uh, consolidation therapy with uh, with uh, the quadruplet therapy, in in my opinion, um, but I, I honest opinion think CAR T will be a best replacement for even the newer drugs. You know, it doesn't mean like we're not going to use it because unfortunately CAR T is not curable. Uh, it can get you in remission, but I think we will have really great options that the CAR T will be. Um, most likely moving forward very fast, and maybe the daratumab uh, or the other treatments will move a little bit second line again. Um, that might be a, the future for the myeloma. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great way to think about it. I mean, I think uh, we try to be relatively conservative in the medical world, right? You're the champ yeah. until someone knocks you out. And so until yes. we have clear evidence that <laughs> something is better than... And, than and, 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 and it looks like CAR-T is really going to knock uh, stem cell trends. Yeah, I I, I, I'm seeing that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so no, I, I, I agree with you. 
Someone's asked a, a tough question here. I appear to be reacting negatively to Revlimid, two ICU visits, low blood pressure. Have you seen this occur? Uh, uh, is there a good alternative to Revlimid? Uh, these are a little bit tougher questions to ask when we don't know the whole context of it. And we always encourage people at these workshops to make sure that they discuss this with their uh, with their uh, healthcare providers. Uh, typically, Revlimid does not have a direct impact on blood pressure in the heart, but yet it can in some individuals, in particular if people may have a, a condition along with their myeloma called amyloidosis. Uh, so I think that's just something that has to be discussed. Similarly, someone else asked a question saying, I had a transplant and I, I relapsed, it appears about two years later, I was on Revlimid uh, prior to transplant, now going on to Kyprolis. Is this normal? Um, it, it is normal in the sense that unfortunately we do see people relapse after transplant. And, you know, from the, the, the numbers that Dr. Abdullah showed that typically if we don't give any maintenance, on average, the disease comes back about two years later on maintenance. It's a little over four years. So that's one of the reasons why we give maintenance therapies. It keeps people on, in remission for uh, typically a, a couple of years longer. But again, that has to be uh, thought out. Here's a question for Kelly. Uh, <laughs> will this workshop be available to send to family members? Yes, and you can just direct them to our website under uh, videos and webinars. Uh, that will be up and you'll get a notice for you that registered an electronic email about where that link is. But that's real important to the foundation and, and we'll find you'll find great access to this. Some people get to it and pause it so they can keep notes and get stuff ready for their doctors. And we encourage that kind of uh, interaction. Well, make sure you're involved here, Cal, for sure. So yeah. I we talked a little bit about um, um, vaccinations earlier, so I don't think we'll go in a lot of detail, but maybe just ask Rebecca as well, because um, uh, we I had asked uh, Dr. Abdella earlier a bit more about the um, uh, uh, vaccinations. You know, for example, you're centered MD Anderson. Are you giving, uh, are you allowing people to have the flu and the COVID shot together, or are you insisting that they have them separated in time and space? Yeah, we... We, I, it's okay to give them together. I think the CDC guidelines was to that there wasn't any specific risk. I know some experts are saying to space them out two weeks apart from the RSV vaccine, um, but we've been typically giving them together unless there's other reasons why they shouldn't. For instance, if they have an ongoing infection or if they just receive CAR T therapy or something like that, those would be reasons why we might um, postpone um, vaccinations. But um, for the most part, um, it's okay to give them together. Yeah, yeah I think that's an excellent answer. Um, oh, here's a nice uh, question. It says, are myeloma patients cured in remission with MRD negative for over two or five or 10 years uh, or longer under your algorithms? Yeah, th these is a great question. I mean, I think sometimes I say, as Kelly has heard me say before, if I put 10 myeloma doctors in a room, I have 12 opinions about anything. Right? So <laughs> our first group, That's right? true. That's true. But, but how do you define cure? And cure can be defined in different ways. We can define cure biochemically. We can define cure clinically. We can define cure. I always say the best way to define cure is what the average Joe, you can say that when your name is Joe, by the way, what the average Joe on the street thinks cure is. If I walk up to someone on the street and say, hey, what do you, how do you define the cure of a disease? And that typically means that someone gets a treatment and then the disease doesn't come back and they don't have to think about it. And, and that's why it's hard for us to use that word so commonly. And I agree with Dr. Abdullah that there are a fraction of patients that essentially get cured that, you know, uh, if you will, die of something else. Not that we get excited about anybody dying of something else, but we put their myeloma asleep for so long that it doesn't wake up again. And so I think for most of us, we want to see as we move towards a cure, that's the whole mission of the IMF is to find a cure for myeloma. And until we do so to support patients through that journey and their care partners. Um, and so I think as we define myeloma, we want to think about a, a, a discrete amount of treatment, not treatment forever. Uh, can we give people a short amount of treatment, maybe less than two years in total, and that puts them into a state where they really don't have to think of the disease anymore. Um, another great question here is multiple myeloma markers such as NGS or NGF with liquid biopsies using mass spectrometry. Um, so, so there's a lot of big letters, a lot of big words here, but, but I'm just going to break it down very simply that one of the great areas of research of myeloma right now is going beyond the basic tests I showed at the start in the Myeloma 101 
but trying to detect tiny amounts of myeloma, as Dr. Abdullah explained when we do the MRD test or minimal residual disease test. This is like saying, is my carpet clean? Uh, well, by looking at it, it looks clean. But if I really want to, I got to get a wet Q-tip and go down there and see if I can find any dust, right? That That's like going down to the tiny amount of dirt. And so these processes, sometimes we use what's called flow cytometry. Sometimes we use what's called sequencing. They're just two different biochemical ways of looking for tiny amounts of disease that may be left. And now we, we're going to very likely in the next year introduce something called mass spectrometry a lot more, which is where we actually can detect tiny amounts of proteins in people's blood, not necessarily just um, in the marrow, where we can find uh, and detect the disease even before the regular tests pick it up. Because one of the things that we would love to know is, can I predict if my patient is going to relapse? Can I catch relapse so early that I can try and extinguish the disease again before the patient? You know, I was talking to one of my patients today who unfortunately, uh, when she relapsed, she had tremendous pain in her leg and required surgery and had to have it pinned because the disease was growing under everyone's noses without evidence. Could, have, could there be more uh, sophisticated ways of detecting the disease? And I think we're, we're, we're moving in that direction. And I think we're going to see us being able uh, to have more wet Q-tips, as it were, and to be able to catch even tiny amounts of the disease present so that we can treat it more effectively. Mm. All right. Um, here comes the, a few other questions. Uh, how does HPV affect myeloma? Uh, I'm on Revlimid and have HPV. I don't know, uh, Rebecca, if you're comfortable answering that. If not, uh, one of us, I'm sure, can. But is that a, is that a question that's come up to you as a nurse uh, about someone who has a human, human papillomavirus? Is that affected by myeloma? You know, I haven't I haven't heard of that one. I mean, myeloma does make you more immunosuppressed, so I don't know if that might cause flare-ups and revlimid, that, of course, will uh, further compound that immunosuppression. Um, <clears throat> I think those are considerations to have, but they, they're things that need to be discussed with your doctor as far as rest, risks and benefits go, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't think we have biologically a natural connection, but we do know you know, when people are immunosuppressed that there are certain viruses that can have more foothold, including HPV. Um, um, so I, I think you've answered that really well. Thank you. Um, here's another uh, good question uh, for you, uh, Dr. Abdullah, with regards to maintenance therapy. Can you address the use of pomalist or pomalidomide as a maintenance therapy? Well, I mean, I will tell you that I use it like, uh, well, I will say newly diagnosed myeloma patients. I use it, but not very common. And these patients who uh, I'll say if they actually failed induction therapy, like, you know, and that was kind of like before the dark tumor even was there, that I used the Velcade Revlimid Dix, they didn't get a better response. So the refractory, I have to use Carfolzomib, Palm Dix, and then Transband. So yeah, these are the patients I use it, but not immediately. So uh, this uh, this is a very rare case that I would use pomalis. Do I use pomalis in second uh, and after second transplant? That's commonly where I use it. But in first transplant, more likely these patients, if they got it, they will be actually refracted to Revlimid, and that will be where I use that pomalis. So it's not commonly to use, but only very specific cases and very few cases I have used it. So yeah, there, there um, and I have that. seen good results, but. Uh, you know, for especially we know that pomalis is, you know, I mean, it's not compared to head to head, but I've seen that even in Revlimid refractory, pomalis is still effective comparing to the Revlimid. Right. So for clarity for the audience, you know, pomalidomide or pomalist is kind of the next generation after Revlimid. Yeah. Uh, there was that study that the that Dr. Nuka presented this last year using carfilzomib and pomalidomide as maintenance therapy in high-risk patients. So there is sometimes a little bit of an interest of potentially doing that. Uh, for the person who asked a question as saying, this is all Greek to me, I'm sorry that it's Greek to you. I know it's confusing, there's so many different things, but just to clear is asking what, what Revlimid was. So back to the basics, you know, there are three major classes of regular drugs of myeloma. The, the mids, the mabs, and the mides, but um, the, the, what we call the imids, uh, like revlimid and pomalidomide, that's in one group. The proteasome inhibitors, the bortezomib, or what's also called Velcade, and the problem with all these drugs, they have two names, the generic name and, and the trade name. So Velcade um, and bortezomib are the same. Carfilzomib and Kyprolis are the same, fit in that second bucket. 
in that third, as does ixazomib or ninlaro. And then the third bucket are the monoclonal antibodies, uh, darzalex or daratumumab, sarclisa or isotuximab, uh, uh, implicity or elotuzumab. Those are those the three historical classes. We've added some new classes now, as I mentioned, including uh, a drug called Selenexor. But the two brand new approaches is CAR T cell therapy, of which there are two, the Abecma, uh, also known as Idacel, and Carvicti, also known as Siltacel, and then the bispecific antibodies. Uh, and those bispecific antibodies are uh, Teclistamab, Talquetamab, and l -renatumab. I know that's like so much to take mm. in. Um, so, so those are the ones that we are uh, just talking about now because they've literally just been approved over this uh, last year. All right, Kelly, I think we're going to take a few more yes. questions to be able to wrap up a Please. little bit quickly. Uh, but here's, uh, again, uh, you know, so many great questions that are coming in. Uh, but someone is asking... Um, uh, Oh, where was it here? Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, when I relapsed, I started on implicity. After eight months, I have, refra ref I guess, refractory disease. Now my doctor wants to add Revlimid. All I hear from other patients who have taken Revlimid is negative. The side effects apparently have been worse than the effects. Uh, the schedule, uh, it's being scheduled at 10 milligrams. Again, it's a little bit of a specific question without knowing the whole context. Typically, when we use Implicity, we use it in combination with another drug. So Implicity by itself has historically not been a drug we use by itself. It typically has two major partners, either lenalidomide or Revlimid or pomalidomide or pombolist. Um, and so I think that should be discussed a little bit more with your uh, primary care or with your, your, your primary oncologist uh, to sort out a little bit of that detail uh, as to why it's being added and and uh, 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 why it's not and, and what would be the ideal combination for you. Um, is it possible to have liquid biopsies from regular blood or serum to find my spouse have carried myeloma on the pancreas with a tumor? Um, uh, is it possible to transplant if need be? Again, this sort of very specific question here is great to ask that. Um, Typically, if we want to know if myeloma is present, we have to do a true biopsy. As I mentioned, we're doing these newer studies now to try and detect it in the blood. Um, it, we can detect even small amounts of plasma cells circulating in the blood. But I think, um, I, I think that kind of question is going to be a little bit difficult to answer without knowing uh, the whole of the context. So, Kelly, I think we have addressed pretty much every one of these questions. Um, you have lots of questions one, tonight. Last one is just question. how can international patients access relevant oh. files in the U.S.? Um, and I'm going to answer that just by saying that, you know, there are large databases like clinicaltrials.gov that let you know at least what trials there are. But we at the IMF, we're actually revamping um, the way we are uh, listing clinical trials. But the info line can be of help um, to at least let people know where clinical trials are and which ones they are. Um, and some, some of our international patients can indeed come and get these trials. So typically, as I mentioned earlier, there may be significant costs. Uh, not, not often is a full insurance coverage available for international patients, but in some cases that can happen. I've had many patients come from other countries and their own home insurance has covered their uh, uh, participation in a trial. Uh, we want to be as inclusive as possible to try and help as many people as possible. But I'm going to stop there, and I'm just going to say, yeah. Kelly, it's been a, a privilege, as always, and to uh, to have uh, Dr. Abdella and uh, Rebecca with us has been a real joy. But I'll turn it to you to wrap it up, boss. Well, thank you, and bravo to you three. I, I just, I'm humbled by having you here speak tonight, and I'm very grateful. So is our sponsors, uh, Abby, Amgen. Bristol Smyre, Squibb, GSK, Jensen Oncology, Cario Farm, Santa Fe, and Takeda. Next slide, please. Okay. Got a few things coming up here, uh, but uh, uh, September 23rd, we have an Empower in Tampa. That's what Dr. Joe was talking about. And then Detroit, November 4th. Uh, you can find all these details on our website at myeloma.org, but please pay attention to our website. 
put it on your uh, your favorites bar because you need to come back frequently to find out what we're doing. Next slide, please. Thank you for attending today's program. Uh, the IMF, myself, the two doctors and the nurse are very grateful. You remember the survey piece that I needed you guys to fill out. That was earlier in the day. Um, is that slide up right now? There it is. Feedback, 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 feedback. You got it? Feedback, feedback, feedback. Please take the time to fill this out. It's incredibly important to us. Next slide. And there we go. You're going to see this on the website. You're going to see a video replay, and it should be up there in about a week. So please come back to our website, and please share this with all members of your family, even doctors and patients that you know. So thanks again for attending tonight. It is with my heart saying to you, I'm very grateful. MyLoba.org.